your life. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Today, we are presenting our 13th in a series of 20 demonstrations, conversations, and sale of Native American pottery. And our honored guest today is Jackie Shativa from Acoma Puebla. But before we meet Jackie, uh, I wanted to explain a few things about why we're doing this uh, present, these presentations. There is an annual event in Santa Fe called Indian Market. Either this year or next year is their 100th anniversary. It celebrates the arts and crafts of the Native American people of, of our country. And about oh, 1,200 to 1,500 artists, artists display their work. For some, it is a, a great portion of their annual income. For a lot of them, it's their only annual income. And this year, because of the COVID virus, it's been canceled. And for some people, it's been absolutely devastating. So here at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, and by the way, I'm Andrea Fisher, I uh, decided with my son Derek that we would have or give an opportunity to some of our favorite people to be able to sell their wares online through us, along with speaking, talking, engaging for a long period of time. And the long period of time is intentional because that way you will have a much better understanding of all the time it takes to make the pieces and a little bit more about the culture that each one of these potters comes from and a little more detail about their own individual lives. Not only what happens to them today, but what happened all those years they were growing up on the Pueblo. And by the way, just for reference, the word Pueblo is merely a Spanish word that means village. And there is also another word, reservation. And village, Pueblo, and reservation are pretty much interchangeable. The only difference might be is that the reservation encompasses all the land that each one of the Pueblos own, and there may be more than one village on the reservation. But other than that, you'll hear us using those words interchangeably today, and just so you have a, an idea of what that means. We're doing 20 of these series. This is lucky number 13, and uh, we are just delighted to have Jackie. But before I introduce her, I want to tell you what's coming up next so you can mark your calendar and maybe even tell your friends. But uh, tomorrow, we're going to have Carolyn Concho. And Carolyn is from Acoma Pueblo also, just like Jackie. In fact, I think they're neighbors up on, the, uh, on top of the mesa, but we'll get to that later. And Carolyn does these wonderful membrane designs on both plates and seed pots. And colorful, lovely animals with, every, with all the meanings of all the animals and the designs. Carolyn is extremely well versed in that. She'll be here tomorrow with lots and lots of sea pots and probably some plates too. Uh, we look forward to seeing her. The next, oh, and it begins at 11 o'clock tomorrow, Mountain Time, and ends at 4, more or less. It, it sort of ends when it ends. We have that feeling when we know it's over. Uh, but anyway, um, then on Saturday, we will have Sammy Naranjo and his um, significant other, Melanie Gutierrez, and they both do sgraffito work from Santa Clara, Puebla. Sammy makes containers, and Melanie makes turtles with the these, these same sort of design and sgraffito work on her turtles. Now, the last, next week will be the last week. I can hardly believe that it's all flown by so, so quickly, sort of. Uh, but next week on Tuesday, and it will run Tuesday through Saturday, on Tuesday we'll have Candelario Suazo, who also does graffito work from um, Santa Clara Pueblo, but her style is very, very different. And her subject matter is very different than Sammy as well. She likes to do birds. 
She likes to do animals and butterflies, and so we'll see lots of wildlife on her pottery, whereas on Sammy and Melanie, that will not be the case. And then on Wednesday, next Wednesday, we're not going to go any further than that, by the way. Next Wednesday, we are going to have Angie Yazzie, who does beautiful micaceous pieces. Angie is from Taos Puebla. And this piece is absolutely unbelievable because it is thin as a piece of paper. I swear that every time I pick up one of her pots, my arms fly up. Um, we tease her about, you know, why doesn't she make them out of clay instead of styrofoam? Because they are just so light and wonderful. Anyway, the whole schedule is posted on our website at www.andreafisherpottery.com slash 2020. If you are interested in seeing any of our pots that are for sale, especially Jackie's, and let me tell you how to get to Jackie's work uh, right away. If you go to our website, then click on Artists, and then click on S for Shativa. You'll find Jackie, and you'll also find right below her Stella, and who we'll talk about later, Shativa. Click on Jackie's name, and her pieces will come up. The first one you'll see will be the most expensive one, and as you scroll down, they are just in descending order of price. So the least expensive ones are at the bottom. And Feel free to give us a call. Like they say on the shopping network, operators are standing by. And we have Becca and Jen today in the back that will be happy to answer all your questions and, and take all your information. Now, while this uh, demonstration and conversation is going on, uh, you may see people walking around in the background, or you may see a dog barking or a dog with his head on somebody's lap. Uh, that, those are our two gallery dogs. And we are really thrilled that they are here. And no, they, are, they don't break anything. Their tails don't do anything. And that um, we consider the humans to be far more dangerous than the, the canines. So, during this presentation, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to go to the, the YouTube place where you can type them in. We will do our very, very best to answer them. And uh, we are absolutely thrilled and delighted to have Jackie Shativa here with us. And Jackie, if I can introduce you, and maybe you could say, a couple words about yourself, and then we're off and running. Sure. Hi, Andrea. Um, my name is Jackie Shativa. I am from the Pueblo of Acoma. I reside there and um, lived there all my life. I uh, grew up, and as I was growing up, it just, you know, I did various things, jobs and whatnot. But somehow, in the back of my um, <clears throat> background, I had that feeling of earth. Yeah. So that's what drove you to pottery? Yeah. How, how long have you been making pots? OK, let's see. It's been probably 40, I'd say 44 years now that I've been doing pottery. You started when you were two? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, in Mama's womb. No, <laughs> um, I start actually started when I was probably eighteen. 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 Oh. When I started getting the feel of um, working with clay. Yeah, you know, I found that uh, with some of the potters that they had a mentor, like a mama or a grandma. Mm -hmm. And when they were little kids, they played with the clay, but they were never really serious about it until they reached almost the end of those teenage years. And I guess there's a lot of growing up to do and things like boys are maybe more important <laughs> <laughs> part of that time than sitting home and, and making clay. Uh, 
But uh, what, what are you going to do for us today? Um, well, I'm going to uh, show you how I make my potter, which I'm known for. It's the corrugated. And that's done like in uh, the old traditional way, the corrugated. What, what do you mean by corrugated? Corrugated is um, it's a coil pot. Uh -huh. So I, I do what I do is roll coils like ropes, and then you layer them. So as you're layering them, and um, back in the in our ancestral period, they did corrugated. Um, and and uh, well, Derek is probably going to put the camera on some of Jackie's work so you can uh, get an idea of what the finished product looks like. And of course, you know the reason, the main reason that we're here is to help the artists fill the gap in their um, their financial situation uh, by being able to sell their pieces here online during these demonstrations and conversations. So the pieces that you see over there will benefit Jackie and her family uh, directly. But if you notice, when, if you, when you're looking at the, the pots, uh, that corrugation, it's, it, it reminds me of corrugated cardboard mm -hmm. because there is one layer of paper at, well, two layers of paper like two uh, pieces of bread on a sandwich. And inside is another layer that undulates up and down, which gives that uh, corrugated cardboard far more strength uh, than if you just use those three effective sheets of paper alone. Are your corrugated pots stronger than ones that are not? Um. Actually, with the corrugated pots, because they're done in coils, and then we have, you know, so when you're coiling, you're actually overlapping. So yes, and then, so as you're going around, then you're taking it back and smoothing the inside. So it's kind, of, it does seal it, and it's almost the same, same as doing regular pottery, because regular pottery you still coil, mm -hmm. but with that you're smoothing from the inside. And then the outside. And then you'll be able, you'll be able to, mm -hmm. you're going to show us how you do all of that. Now, you said it was done in prehistoric times, corrugated pottery. Did it have a special use? Uh, yes. In those days, um, they used them as cooking vessels. And for that reason, the reason why they had the indentations on them, and back then they used to, um, they called it pinch pot or because um, that's what they did or they used their uh, fingernail to make the indentations on the pot. So either they were pinching it as they were going along, as they were laying the coils. And the purpose for that was when you cook in them, it was, it was easier for them to heat up water, cook in it faster rather than having, if you have a smooth bowl, your flames are going to go around it. With the indentations in the bowl, it's going into the little crevices. Oh, okay, because, you know, I, I've always wondered whether maybe it retained the heat mm -hmm. um, a little better, or maybe it was a way of telling the everyday dishes from the Sunday dishes. <laughs> <laughs> And so right. you, yeah. you know, you use the bowls that are nicely smooth and have a paint decoration on them when you serve, and all those things that um, have the corrugations. And well, they're the ones that belong in the fire. But there is a, a, a reason, mm -hmm. so that the heating is faster. Yes, or it's faster. It's faster, and it, it um, like I said, it takes the heat's going to take in more faster, and it cooks. And that, I think that's how they realized that trying to smooth the surface didn't work as fast as the corrugated Yeah, smoothing. and when you have to go somewhere and get the wood, oh, yeah. you want that pot to heat up as fast as mm -hmm. possible. Before you run out of wood. Before yeah. you run out and have to go <laughs> get some more. Now, you said it was done in prehistoric times, but you know if you look at the historic pieces of Acoma, you really don't see... Cookware, that cookingware 
um, not very much of it. Is it because, I mean, there could be lots of reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. it could be because it went out of fashion mm -hmm. or because metal pots replaced them mm -hmm. um, or, um, and I can't think of any others. <laughs> well, one of the reasons is, as I read the history of Ras Mom and my grandma would tell me was that they traveled, they moved from different areas to different areas. So as they're traveling, of course, they're either going by uh, wagon or horseback, so the pots break. So they yeah. just leave them. And so when we go pick pottery, we find all these pieces just scattered here mm -hmm. and there. And these are some of the pieces. This is actually corrugated. And then, of course, you have the, the traditional uh, pots that they were designed. So they would just leave them because, of course, they're going to just replace it by making another pole, another pot, you know. So, and it was lighter for them to travel, too, I mean, than having yeah. to. Yeah, pots are heavy and they break. Yeah. It's so much easier to just take a frying pan that you get from Walmart <laughs> and carry that around. But yeah. uh, so... Corrugation went out of style because of convenience, do you think? Uh, probably so. Yeah. And uh, people, of course, not everybody did that style or that version. So then they just went straight to the just smooth painted pots. So um, your family, your, I know your mama, is your mama responsible for... Uh, sort of repopularizing corrugated pots? Uh, she was. Uh, yeah. She's the one that actually revived the style. And her name is Stella. Stella Shativa. Shativa. And, and on the yeah, and on the list in, in our potters, Stella's right below Jackie. And we do have uh, a couple of Stella's pieces uh, now. And you know, when you go to museums and you see those dioramas with the Indians sitting around the fake fire, and they have food in the, what well, they have fake food in the fake pots. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. But uh, they are depicting what a scene might have looked like many mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago, of the preparation of foodstuffs by the Native Americans. That's, that's a little nicer. But when you know they were hanging out and cooking together, uh, you see those pots in the fire, those corrugated pots, and they're all gray. Um, is that because the fire? Uh, yeah. A lot of the pieces you'll find or you see are burnished black, and it is due to the firing. Then again, um, we've actually found whole pieces where just from the wear and tear. So as the, as the, mm -hmm. the years pass, you know, the, you're going to see the the colors change on them. Well, yours and your mama's pieces are pure white, mm -hmm. except when you choose to paint a little decoration right. on them. But they're pure white, white. Mm -hmm. so they, they are strictly decoration. Mm -hmm. And they've never been in the fire other than um, to uh, do the final process in right. the making mm -hmm. of the pieces. Yeah. Can you use them to cook uh, in? You can. Um, we even still use our, our jars, which are the, the wider open mouth, and we use that to store water in. So like during the summertime, uh, and it actually, it's like a refrigerator. It keeps the water cold, but it also has this, this taste, the water, it smells like rainwater. Yeah. And you, it's, it's funny because you just want to keep drinking and drinking out of that. Yeah. But we still use them. We still, you know, you, so you them, still yeah. use them. They taste like rain. They taste like summer. Mm -hmm. And that's, I know that's a very difficult thing to realize if you live in an apartment building somewhere on the, the East Coast. But uh, there is that smesh, special smell mm -hmm. uh, in New Mexico when, when it begins to rain. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, and I'm sure that water uh, picks up that flavor. But, and also, you know, the reason that they're so cold is because the pot, the water is continually leaching through the pots. Mm -hmm. And yes. 
um, as one person said, the pots are sweating. And uh, scientifically, it takes heat for evaporation. And when a water evaporates, the heat comes from the water. And uh, that's why there's a cool drink of water. But now, if you use those corrugated pots for water over and over and over again, will they disintegrate? Um, I have not yet seen that happen, uh -huh. so I'm, you know, I'm not a. Uh, I can I can see it maybe on a daily use, you know. Yeah. But other than that, I they they fell for this more, long. Yeah, more than more than likely they yeah. break they break right. first. Somebody yeah. drops it. Right. Uh huh. Wow. Does the corrugation make it easier to handle the pot too? Is it easier to pick up and? Yeah, uh -huh. it, it is because you have. It's almost like a, a glove. You know, you grip it, and of course, if you have a smooth piece, you know you. Especially it if it's wet. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, you can slip out. But with the corrugated, it seems to have that. Um, like I said, like a glove. You just put your hand on there, and you you have the the grip on it. Okay. So it does. So now that we know a little bit about the kind of work you do, maybe you can uh, start and show us, you know, how you do it, do you know, in action. Okay, sounds good to me. So, you have, I do mine on a, uh, a wood surface. It's easier for, for, for you to have control of the clay. Does so. the wood absorb some of the moisture from the clay? Yes, it does absorb now, the moisture. Where, where do you get your clay? Um, from home, uh, up in the Pueblo there. And what we do is um, we go gather, of course, I'll show you. We do use the old pottery shards here that we gather. So this is all old so, pieces. So that's something that's already been made, been fired, been right. broken, mm -hmm. and is on is laying on the, the ground. The ground. Uh -huh. So we, what we do is collect them and we crush them up. Uh -huh. um, and we crush this up into a real fine sand. So it's kind of like your, um, uh, how would you say, your base or like a pigment that you use to add. Now this is all clay. This is shale. We so call this so shale. The, the, the ground of pottery shards are, are like temper? Yeah, they that's give, the word. Tem yeah, they, they're like a the temper. They give the clay strength. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you didn't use temper in your pots, what would happen? Um, the, 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 the clay would be tougher to work with, and it'll not be so solid. Uh -huh. it'll, it'll probably might fall apart. Might fall apart. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so you need some kind of a temper to make the clay stronger and give it a little bit more strength. And if you were uh, mixing the, the clay with a temper, what sort of proportions do you use? Um, so you're going to use more clay. So I usually use about anywhere from two to three pounds, even more five pounds clay to get a good size of, of clay. So the more, you, the more you shale you use, and then the, the broken charts, the, the fine sand, you just use that as the tempera. And you just kind of like measure out. And then you kind you of have, sprinkle it on? Yeah. Or? Sprinkle yeah. it on, then get a feel of your clay to uh -huh. the, the texture of So it's a lot of it's by touch mm -hmm. rather than by, by weighing touch. or measuring yeah. in any way. So you see how the difference, you can see the gray and then all of a sudden you see the darkness. Now what are we looking at there? This is shale. This is pure clay. And yeah. we gather this at home too. And it's actually, we have to um, hike it and haul it. It looks like it's hard as a rock. It does. But once you soak it, and, uh, and that's what we do, the process is soaking the clay till you get it crushed, uh, like just small pieces. So you're, you're putting it out in the sun, um, and it breaks up. So you just keep adding water to it and let it air dry in the sun till it comes real crumbled. I have a question, like a silly question. If it breaks up in the presence of water, mm -hmm. What happens when it rains? Does it break up? Um, it, it actually does the same thing. 
it'll, it does, it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll get, um, and actually I like to do that, leave it out in the rain and let it um, just crumble up. And then after it rains and whatever, then you can let it dry. But if it gets really crumbly, how do you, how do you get it? Um, or do you just ignore the crumbly stuff when you are digging the clay? No, we use everything. You use everything. We use everything. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, you know, in in these thirteen series, uh, we have talked about um, clay and clay sources and and how you mix clay and what you add to clay and all that other kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And the reason that we do that with every single person, and we watch them make a pot just about with every single person. Because every, every area, every Pueblo, has a slightly different nuance. And, I mean, if you look yesterday and saw Sherry Tafoya's clay, it looked like, you know, dark chocolate that you expected to turn it over and see some almonds like in a Hershey bar. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it yeah. looked just like the dark chocolate, but your clay doesn't look like that. Um, at all, and you know, considering that Santa Clara and Acoma, uh, if you're thinking like worldwide, they're probably as the crow flies, maybe 50, 60 miles mm -hmm. away from each other, and how different the materials are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, each uh, Pueblo has different materials and they respond differently right. and consequently the additives and the way they're treated are different mm -hmm. and what this series is trying to do is to uh, show those differences and also to be able to have each one of these demonstrations and presentations and conversations uh, be all self-contained right. uh, because so many demonstrations that I have seen that have been recorded uh, they'll take one phase of it and probably not go into much detail mm -hmm. and they last 30 minutes and you don't have any idea of the total process right. and so the clay looks like that dark gray mm -hmm. now when you go collect clay uh, you said you get it at home. You yeah. mean like like in the in the back bedroom? Oh, or? I, I wish it was that easy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, we and we go in. This last time I went to go get clay, I took my girls and um, uh, my husband, and, and we went hiking. And it's actually further into the village, so you're going maybe. I uh, would say about 27 miles. Then it's another two miles to hike uh -huh. to the the pit area where to the clay where the, is. The clay is. Yeah. is there only one source of clay at Acoma, or are there as, many? As far as I I know, there's only one section. Uh -huh. um, I've seen other clays, with, like we have um, several other clays that you can use, and um, I've tried those, and they come out different colors. Yeah. So you, you kind of, I've experienced with different clays, but the clay that, this type of clay here, it's in one area, and like I said, you have to hike for it, and then you have to haul it. What do families sort of lay claim to various areas? Um, like, don't go over there and touch that because it belongs to so-and-so. But I think we all, as, as, as potters, as, uh, you know, we take Mother Earth, you know, we all pray for for our clay and that we have continue to have this for us as people. Uh -huh. So um, I've never seen anybody fight, you know, over and say, this is my location, you can't go there, or, you know, there may be some out there, but I think we all share, you know, uh -huh. and, and I know there's some, several of us that share ideas, you know, mm -hmm. or share, have you tried this, have you, you know, use this type of paint or did you ever find this color or just different things because we mm -hmm. gather up most of our materials like our clay, our paints, our slips, those all come from the wood, the, from yeah. the, the, the well, pueblo there. You know, if you are drive, you're driving the 27 mm -hmm. miles to go get the clay, 
If you're driving 27 miles and that's still home, mm -hmm. how big is the is the the reserve is Akamo Reservation? It, I'm not sure how I've never really understood it because what it's pretty big. I mean, if you can go 27 miles to to uh, Old Akamo, which is probably from from my house, and I live on the out, outer part of the reservation, uh -huh. closest to the border of the reservation is where I live. So you're driving in, and I would say maybe another 50, 60 miles in, you would think, for so the it's border, because we've, we've actually bought back land, so it's been extending out. So we've been getting a lot of our land that was taken away from us. And yeah. I have so not. that, I mean, that's a big piece of land if mm -hmm. you're going 60 miles. Yeah. Uh, I might be wrong, but I I know it's. Uh huh. Yeah. And and do you know how many about how many people live at Akama? Our the last time I I heard our population was over I'd say um, close to twenty seven uh, twenty seven hundred three thousand. Twenty seven hundred. Yeah. Wow, that's not very many. Yeah. And how many of those twenty seven hundred? People are potters. Um, I would say maybe twenty percent. It's not. There's twenty um, percent. Yeah. That that's that's, that's a lot. It, uh huh. Yeah. That's four hundred potters. And, and, and it's it's it's. Um, you know, you're looking at uh, a lot of the younger generation are now coming coming out who their grandparents or their aunts or their uncles even. Some of the men that are becoming potters now. Oh too. yeah, lots of men. Yeah. yeah, yeah, surprisingly so. And and you know, I always thought that in the Native American culture, the pottery making was women's work because it was so hard. Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah, true. And now that um, uh, you see a, a lot of men starting to make pottery, and it's and they have their ideas and yeah. they're they're talented too. Yeah. yeah. Well, why do you think that, that those gender-specific roles are changing? Do you have any idea why men are doing it? Because I have some ideas about why it might be changing. Uh -huh. um, well, you take a look at they've, um, they were probably raised by mothers or, or grandmas. Uh, siblings, grandmas yeah. that were potters. And um, so, of course, most of the men, they're just, you know, go to work, an everyday job, you know, away from home. So now they've taken interest in, and they've probably had that, um, they had it in them to, to do work. And um, Yeah, like ta yeah, talent isn't right. gender specific yeah. probably. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons. Because yeah. you, see, you see them doing like other artwork, you know, like carvings or whatever. Um, beat work or leather work. So they said, if I can do that, let me try working yeah. with clay. Or were handed the clay and said, try this, you know, yeah. work with this. See what you can make. Grandmas have a way yeah. of doing oh, that, yeah. don't they? Yes. <laughs> and then sticking by them and if they, <laughs> you know, if they see that there's some talent there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also because Native American pottery is no longer considered a curio or a souvenir. Right. Instead, it's, it's really considered a piece of art. And art brings more money than curios and souvenirs. Right. And a, a, a person can make a decent living mm -hmm. being a potter. And, and so that's true for both men and women. Right, yes. And also, you know, yes, they go hunting, but it isn't a matter of life and death to go out and chase down an animal. Mm -hmm. um, you can go hunting for the sport or for the, uh, the fact that uh, it's part of a ceremony and you need to have various animal parts and, 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 the present, uh, and parts of it turned into food uh, right. to feed people. But it isn't an absolute daily necessity. You can go the, you know, the meat counter in the grocery store and, you know, pick yeah. up a pound of pork chops. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so 
with those sorts of duties gone, maybe it gives men a little bit more time mm -hmm. and a little less pressure right. uh, to yeah. be able to uh, spend some time making pots. Uh, but anyway, when you collect the clay, um, how much do you get at a time? Um, we're looking at a, we haul clay. We usually take it in backpacks and stuff. So I this last, I got uh, probably maybe over a 25 gallon um, bins, two of them. Uh-huh. So the, the trash bins. Yeah. And we haul as much as we can because um, like I said, it, it's it's a ways to go and to try to do that on a daily basis or go when you need the clay. Yeah. We, you, like you when bring, it's snowing. You, right. Winter uh -huh. time, it's even harder to get to. So we haul back as much as we think we can use for probably for the year or for the six months. And um, we haul it back. And, it, and the 27 miles is on a dirt Washboard yeah, well, road. It, it, well, you go on into the reservation and then you go off off road. So yeah, you're traveling on a dirt road, but you're also hiking up a yeah. um, a mesa. Uh -huh. So the mesa goes up for a quarter of a mile, then you go into the top of the mesa for another mile and a half. And then so, you have to carry it then all. Then you dig back. out the clay. So you're yeah. digging out the clay and and. Um, Having to haul it all the way back, back down. <laughs> yeah, luckily um, the clay source is not, uh, you know, up downhill to begin with, right. so that you have to carry it back uphill. Exactly. And and um, your twenty five garbage can, twenty five gallon garbage cans full of clay, will uh, last you how long? Uh, that actually, I'm still on my my clay and I'm going on two years now. Two years. Two and you years. make a lot of pots. I do make a lot yeah, of pots. Yeah, you make a lot of so pots. So it's, it's lasting me. Plus I've had some from previous time, but it was the time when I had all my kids, let's go hiking, we're going on a picnic. Oh, <laughs> nice. Do we have a question? We, we don't have a question, but we have a comment. The comment is that the Acoma Reservation of the Acoma Pueblo people is part of Cibola, Socorro, and Catron counties. It covers 594.96 square miles. Wow, so oh. I was wrong. Well, that's good. Well, thank yeah. you. Whoever sent that information? D. Handler, but I'm not sure. Oh, well, I think thank it's Bob. You. Oh, Bob. Oh, thanks, thanks Bob. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, now thank I, you. I'm, I'm uh, they informed me on history, too, now. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, well, that's good. That's really adds a lot to the presentation that we have some, you know, exact numbers, yeah. other than just saying it's really big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And actually, there's areas where I haven't seen that I've, I've I know of, and um, now I'm going to go on a venture and go find. Yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> go out and see those 500 square miles. Uh huh. Especially when you're not allowed off the reservation now, oh, right? Or yeah. uh, other people aren't allowed in. Well, so you, you collect all that clay and you mix it with the temper. If you want to, uh, let's see how you start okay. a piece of pottery. That would be just great. Okay, so right here is my clay. So once we break, do all the shale and stuff, this is my clay here. So this is the clay here that I have. And so... It's already been. It's already been mixed and sifted, and, and it's sifted and everything. Uh, the, the clay is mixed. Of course, you use water, and then you use your the the shard sand. And when you have the clay, you're just you're kneading it, mm -hmm. so you're feel, feeling the texture of how much um, of the the pottery shard that we use to add to the clay, and I guess. Just if you add too much, it'll probably dry too quick. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to make sure your clay is always going to be moist. And there's no formula for that. Uh, it's just by feel. By feel. So what you said is you go out and you dig the clay, uh -huh. and then uh, if I recall, you let it dry, 
And then you soak it in water. And soak it again. And then you, um, with the stuff that's, you know, in the water, all the seeds and roots and all that other kind of stuff, does that all float to the top of the water? It, it will, and that's where, that's where the sifting comes in because you're going to um, sift it out. Um, so any kind of, um, like, grass or anything that's uh -huh. in there or that gets in there, you just kind of um, pick it out, sift it out, and it will rise to the top. Now, now do you pour it through some kind of a strainer? Uh, I don't. I do sift my, um, my shard sand. Because uh -huh. you want to get out the, the, the bigger pieces, so you, yeah. I, I try to use the fine, the fine sand, which makes it easier to work with. So if you have bigger chunks of the shards, the pottery shards, then that's where you find out in your firing process if you have a pit, you know, it'll, it'll pop. So you just, and, and like I said, once we start mix, mixing the clay, we're um, kneading the the, I like to say dough. We're kneading yeah, the, the clay. Dough, right. well, it is sort and of like And then you can also dough. start uh -huh. when you're pressing down on the clay, you're feeling any um, hard objects or big pieces of the shale that didn't get crushed down. Yeah. So you'll feel these, and then that's when you pull them out, and you know, you'll pick, pick at your clay. And if you don't take those pieces out, what happens? That's where you find out, like... Uh, Hopefully you're going to get it when, you, when the pot's dry and you're scraping your pots and smoothing them out. And then you have your stones that you use, and they'll pop out. So that's your second chance of getting those. Uh, uh -huh. And then the third one is when you're firing. That's when you find out that it, you left one in there because it will pop. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that third chance is really no chance yeah, at all. It could, it, could end, it could end in disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, does that so, happen to you often? It, it has, you know, and that's where I learned to tr try to be um, critique at when yeah. I'm mixing my clay and making sure that that doesn't happen again. So who, did, who taught you all of this? Uh, my mother, Stella, was the one that taught taught me how to do um, corrugated. Of course, I learned how to do uh, the smooth pots, but my, I always wanted to, because I would sit there and watch her make, do her coiling, and, it, and I was like, God, oh, Mom, it, she was so smooth, just, just her, the way she made her pottery, the, the coiling, and then going back and making, I said, that's what I want to learn. One day I want to learn that style. So I, she gave me a clay and says, here's, and, and handed me the clay. Your, your mom's no longer alive. My mother's, uh, she's passed on. She's been gone for now um, 28 years. You know, I remember that. I remember because I was up at the Wheelwright Museum and it was, I mean, she was really young. Yes, she was. My mother was only 49. 49? 49 years old when she oh, passed away. Oh, jeez. So that's, that's too... She was very young. Yeah. Wow. But with, look at the legacy she left behind. Yeah. She left you to carry on. You know, when... when um, I have to tell you this story. So as I was learning to make pottery, and coil, coiling was my thing that I really wanted to learn. So I would make pieces, just little little bows and stuff. Then I started expanding to maybe a bowl this size. So I was making and of course sitting next to mom right there and she was saying, you're doing good, you're doing good. So I had um, gotten to a point where I got to the um, finished part of it. So my bowl was actually this size here, yeah. completed and everything, did my corrugated and I mean my coils weren't as straight as hers. So I said, here mom, look, I finished. And she goes, oh, let me see. So I handed her my bow. She goes, oh my gosh, that looks good. Okay. She smashed, and she <laughs> smashed your, 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 and your I'm, most I'm, precious I'm thing like that ever made. Go, what you do? She goes, start over. And I'm like, 
I, I had tears in my eyes, of course, and then she hurt my feelings. And I did it again. Yeah. And I did it again. And she would do that to me. So as Well, that was probably the biggest favor she could ever do for you. Because, you know, some people um, look at that first piece and say, you know, it's my masterpiece. Uh -huh. And never really get a whole lot better than that. But uh, she sort of forced you to do that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Mom. And at first, I'm like, I didn't want to make no one. I said, okay. And she goes, no. You practice, practice practice. I said, okay. So I did. And you know, as I was doing that, redoing and trying and going over and over, then one day, and this had to have been almost a, a year and a half, two years later, that I started, you know, um, doing the corrugated. Then she says one day while we were um, painting our pottery, like on the handles and stuff. So I was sitting there and she sat back and she goes, she says, I'm a, in our language means daughter. And she was telling me, you know what? I go, what mom? She says, all I need to do is sign my name to your pot and you, you passed. And I'm like, look, you passed. I passed. You passed. Yay. So that, 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 feeling of her saying, well, I'm going to sign my name to your pot, and I don't have to, you know. Yeah. But that was where I knew I had accomplished and got to the point where I was as good as her. Wow. So that was, that was the, I think, my praise. And it took me, like I said, it took me about two, three years to get to that stage, to wow. get to that point. Well, and the idea that she she knew that, that mm -hmm. you were eventually going right. to reach that, and you had the potential to reach that, and all you needed was a you know a little, little kick yeah. now and then, uh, uh, to make it all happen. Now, did where did where did Stella, your mom, learn? She actually, we were picking pottery shards, and um, there was like several of these pieces on the ground. Uh -huh. And she picked this one particular piece like this, corrugated. And she looked at it and she kept looking at it. And she dipped it in the water and she was saying, and she would flip it over and she goes, you know what? She goes, if I read, if I've read books and stuff, she says, and, and uh, history, and she says, I want to try this. Just picking up a piece and of that, shirt. And that's and that, how this revival began. Uh -huh. Because she saw something on the ground. And, yeah, and, she saw a pottery uh, piece. And actually it was, it was part of, it was actually a water jug that had, um, was broken. But all the pieces were there. Oh. So she put the, put the pot together. There were several pieces. And that's where she started looking and saying, you know, huh. I can do that. I can, and she was just turning it around and just looking. And she was telling me the story about it. She goes, and I took that one piece and took it home. Wow. Then, of course, it was smooth in the inside. So she was still wondering, you know, how did they do this? And then she's not. She saw that it was done in coils. Huh. Yeah. So she just started going from there. Um, same process I went through, just working with the clay. And you know, and, and people walked over those pottery shards for you know a hundred years and never thought of reviving that technique. Well, what are you doing there? Right here, I am coiling my pot now. If you saw, I was I started from the center, the long rope. So you're gonna you're twisting it inward, and the clay is still soft, so mm -hmm. it's flexible. So you just keep. Wind started off like this. Once I get it enough to, to where I can set it on a uh, paper towel cloth, and then you just keep adding. So while it's still moist, it's actually sticking to this to the inside of the clay. So this is how I basically start out my base. Wow. You know the um, the pieces that we have on display of Jackie's work are um, all for sale, and the, uh, 
and they benefit Jackie and her family because of the fact that Indian Market is not existing this year and that, well, there's a virtual market, but I don't think that may be over. I don't know for sure. You can check with SWAYA, um, Southwestern Indian Art Association. But uh, all of her pieces are for sale. The, the proceeds uh, are for Jackie so that she can continue her work and uh, be a viable potter. And if you go to our website, you can view them more closely because on the website there, um, like I said before, they start in descending order of price. The measurements are there, the description is there, and all the prices are there because it's a little hard looking on our display and, and seeing the prices. But all the, what you might call specs, are on our website. So all of your bottoms start with that coil that's right. exposed. So it's, you see the center part here, so you just roll it in and you just keep adding and you see the coils are pretty much the same consistency. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing you have that took me time to learn how to make it all one size. Mm -hmm. So, and you, the, the clay is still kept moist, so that's how it tends to hold together. So, do you smooth it on the inside? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. Not not all the way through, though. You'll still see the the um, the coils on the, on the, the outside inside, or on, the, on inside. the inside. Yeah, you'll still see the, the coils too. on the inside, and I'll show you that as we go along. And so you'll smooth it out, so it, it gives it a stronger hold too. Uh -huh. um, even when you're doing your 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 stamping on the clay on the coils, it, it's still holding together, but you get a secure hole once you smooth it from the inside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the coil pot and then I'm going to try, I'm going to do a smooth pot so you have the idea, because I do um, do the regular smooth traditional pot. Okay. But I also do like a half, it's called half corrugated. So these are more or less decorative pieces that I do where the bottom base of the pot is going to be smooth and the top will be coiled. Oh, uh huh. And, and um, oh, well, that would be good. Uh, the combo plate. Right. Uh huh. Combination plate. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, on some of your pieces, uh, you do some painting. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And a few of the pieces that we have, they are painted on handles. The handles. Um, on the handles of the wedding vase. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember, I think on, the, on some other handles on the, the, the sides of the The, 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 water, the canteens. And then I saw, I, like the half, the smooth pot, I sometimes do painting on the bowl. So you have, not only do you have the... the smooth pot, the corrugated, then you have the traditional paint on there, mm -hmm. too. Well, in addition to making pots, you also make owls. I do make owls, and the owls are actually one of my populars, popular items. Um, sometimes, and actually those were my mom's popular items, too, and they do say that um, some people from from different pueblos, even from home, say, well, you make owls? And in, in certain pueblos, it's like a, an omen or it's, it's against their belief to do owls. And um, well, I've I guess, heard from some that yeah. it's the symbol of death. Yeah, it's Because a, I don't know if you've ever been around when an owl goes flying by, but you don't hear anything. I mean, th with other birds, other big birds like that, uh, you hear the wings and the air uh -huh. uh, as they fly by you. But with the owls, you don't hear a thing. It's really, really interesting. But, you know, in, in lots of cultures, owls are good omens. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are symbols of intelligence right. and wisdom. And, uh, and they are very, very clever mm -hmm. and interesting birds. 
Uh, but with some cultures, yeah. the dolls, it's, right? it's, yeah, they, they say, don't have or, that same. Yeah, trying to have them cross their path, just like, uh-oh, you know. Uh-oh. But <laughs> <laughs> my, um, my mother would make the owls, and, and uh, her mom had asked her one time, why do you make owls? And she goes, because they're fun. And because um, they're fun, uh -huh. she always thought they were a fun ca character. Because she would do the owls, she would do turkeys. Um, she did, even did it. Uh, and owls are smart, and turkeys are the dumbest thing <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> I mean, if it, there's a rainstorm, you know, they open their their mouths, and the rain goes in, and they drown. I mean, they don't, they don't have the sense to close their mouth. <laughs> yeah, but she said it's just it's fun. People enjoy them. And, um, you know, she, she says, I've, I was asked to make an owl. That's how she actually got started with someone asking her, do you make animal characters? Do you make birds? You know? Uh -huh. And she says, yeah, I, I do owls. And so yeah. ever since then, she's, that was like a popular item. People took that as, um, like you say, it's, for some people, it's luck, you know, for, yeah. and, and, and I've always done, the owls. I always thought they were character. Oh, I just love the way that their their heads turn around. <laughs> almost three, you know, they could almost go round and round full circle. <laughs> and, uh, and also, they keep the rodent population down. I mean, True. if you have a few mo owls in the neighborhood, you don't have to worry about mice <laughs> because um, that's, you know, that's dinner for them. And... Uh, yeah, it yeah. and some of them, oh, like snowy owls, they are so beautiful to look at. Those and are some the white of them owls, with that, that yeah. heart-shaped face, oh, they're just absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It, I think any bird, right? We have, uh, in fact, at home we have uh, hummingbirds, you know. Oh, yeah, I know about hummingbirds. And then we have these, just the regular bluebirds, yellow birds. And um, of course, then we have the crows and the buzzards and yeah. But you know, and that's one of my designs that I do is hummingbirds. I, I if I paint my pots uh -huh. and stuff, I do hummingbirds. Well, you know, hummingbirds are really interesting. We have zillions of them here in New Mexico because we're on one of the the great migratory flyway, and several of the varieties of hummingbirds come up from South America mm -hmm. and they nest here and hang out at the feeders in my backyard and uh, build nests in some of the strangest places. I have one on the electrical plug oh. uh, that where my garage door opener, my, my garage door plugs into inside the garage. I have one that's in the lamp uh, on my front porch. Uh, these tiny, tiny little nests, and boy, they are—they're really strong and 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 flexible. Uh, and I just found out recently that hummingbird nests are made out of spider webs. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And they gather all these spider webs, and the eggs are, you know, like tic tacs. They're so tiny, wow. and the hummingbirds grow really fast, and. They're much too big for the nest, and that's why they use the spider webs because the nest can stretch to accommodate the little fat kids uh, that are in it <laughs> until it's time for mama to kick them out and say, you're on your own. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, they're just absolutely fascinating. And then the, the rufus, which is the ones that are sort of golden color, um, um. they go up to... They, they start out in Mexico and they go over to the Pacific Ocean and follow the Pacific Ocean up to Alaska and that's where they build their nests and then when they're on their way home they come they follow the flower bloom along the Rocky Mountains uh -huh. and that and since Santa Fe is you know the, the Rocky Mountains end in right. Santa Fe yeah. right you know right at sort of at the city limits on the south that's the end of the the Rocky Mountains, and so we get a lot of those rufous hummingbirds who follow that bloom until they uh, go back to uh, Mexico next oh, wow. month. But in the meantime, uh, we, there are swarms yeah. of them. 
Uh, I have 13 feeders in oh my, my yard that in, on, hanging on my back porch that um, hold a quart each and right now I'm filling all of them at least once a day. And so the, the feeders on the ends, I guess where they feel more comfortable going, uh, uh, now it's twice a day for the feeders on the ends, but uh, they, they're, they're not, I've, I'm convinced they're not birds, they're just little <laughs> flying pigs, because the whole, all they yeah. do is eat. <laughs> and sometimes the sound of all that wing mm. buzzing and all their chattering yeah. is... You know, it's you can hear it forever. It's yeah. deafening because there are so many of them. But you know, I've created a monster by hanging right. up all of those uh, yeah, feeders. Yeah, we, we've, we've got a couple of the feeders at home yeah. too, and same thing. And actually, I, I made a, um, a, a kind of like a bat choice of hanging them right outside my door on the porch because now we're attracting the birds. Uh, that are coming to eat off of the, huh. the, the feeders. Huh. So I'm like, oh gosh. Okay, so we have to move them to the tree to the back side of the house. So, oh, But they're so fun to watch. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see the way they interact with each other because those rufous, those golden colored ones, they are aggressive little things. And um, they just go after all the other ones. Um, I mean, they're the alpha yeah. hummingbirds. Okay, I'm going to show you now. I, I just reversed it, but this is this is how I coiled it from here. So now it's to a point where I can start doing the stamping on it. So I'm going to reverse it, and this is the part where I do a little bit of the smoothing. Uh huh. Um, so the the part where you're doing the smoothing is mm -hmm. the inside. Is the inside. Uh huh. So. And I just use my, these are all my wooden tools that I mm -hmm. use to, to shape. So huh. you, you can see the, the curves on them. And this one here. And actually this was mom's. So this one here was oh. a little bit bigger than this one. And this is, that's how much it's worn down. And, and what's that made out of? Um, it feels like it's balsam wood. But I think it's, um, you know how you have the, the, the baseboards of the home and stuff? So my mom, my, actually it was my father who made her, her this tool here uh -huh. to shape. So he sanded it down and buffed it to get the, oh, so it's, the it's a piece thing. of wood. Yeah, uh -huh. just regular wood. The same way with this, it's regular wood. And it just has the smooth edging sort of to where you can smooth it out. Well, so that's, know, that's what I'm doing here. Well, Jackie, when you get to the point where you have to let the pot sit for a little while and dry before you can you know, build mm -hmm. it a little more. Uh, we're going to have you go over to your pots. Okay. And and you can show people all the bottoms of, of how they're all started. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and and talk about some of, of your designs. Sure. And, and also you should know that uh, Jackie, the ones that you see on display are the ones we chose to put on display. Uh, there are a few more owls in slightly different sizes. And, and the smaller ones, there are some other smaller ones too. Uh, and while they're, they're close uh, in what they look like, but they're not this, exactly the same. So we just chose to put a, a selection. So if there's one particular piece that you like and it looks like someone else has bought it, uh, we might have some backup pieces that are very, very close in size and in, in coloration. Uh, anyway, uh, and so now you've smoothed the inside. This one here is now the smooth pot. I started out with the flat piece. Uh huh. And, and it, can you see the coils on the? On this one here, it, it, you'll start seeing coils when I add on. Because uh -huh. I'll start adding coils. So it, this is one that's smooth on the, the smooth, bottom, yeah. not uh, with the exposed coils on the bottom. Right. So uh -huh. this is this is the your this is your corrugated right here, uh -huh. and this is going to be more of the smooth traditional pots that we uh -huh. do. And so the corrugated one, you're letting it sit and dry for it's, a little yes, bit. Yes. Till I okay, yes. So you're gonna let it sit even with the smooth one. You, you let it sit till it's ready for 
the next coil mm. to be is, added Is on. this a good time maybe yeah. to oh. talk about your pieces sure. over there? So, sure. yeah, and so what we'll do is we'll talk for a few more minutes while Derek gets set up uh, okay. so that it will be able uh, to do that. Now, you do corrugated pots and you do smooth pots and you do combinations of corrugated right. pots and smooth pots. Right. And you do some painting on pots. Mm -hmm. Now, were all those things uh, learned from your mom? Uh, yes, they, I learned how to do, the, well, I, when I first started off, I was doing the smooth pots. They call it the polychrome, the smooth uh -huh. surface. So that's what I started doing. Then when I started working with the coil method, then I did the corrugated. Uh -huh. And as I moved on in years, then I started doing a little bit of contemporary work. Then I add, um, I started adding corn. Um, uh -huh. So the corn is sort of in relief yeah, on it's the a surface. New, it's like a the, new, uh -huh. yeah, a new creation that I start, started doing. Same as like a, the contemporary bows that I do with the, the bear paw or the bear fetish. Uh -huh. um, just different. But di basically all white. Yeah, they're all white, yeah. Now, did you learn from, uh, did your grandma do, was she a potter also? My, my mom's mother, Jessie Garcia, she was. She was a pottery, and she also picked up the corrugated uh, pieces, too. And she was, um, she learned how to start doing the corrugated. Grandma's, In fact, grandma's pot. That's Grandma Jessie. Grandma Jessie yeah. Garcia, who was really famous. Yeah, she did but a lot of polychrome pieces. This uh, corrugated method is... Uh, a real family tradition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow. And, you know, the texture is really wonderful, and they feel good. They feel good. Um, and I really like what Jesse did with his painted design in here. And you almost feel as though this ribbon is just folded right on the, on the top of it. But the continuation, Grandma, and then you will see the the pieces of, of granddaughter. But here she even left the coils exposed, but not corrugated for her handles. And I'm sure this is one of those water jars that Jackie was talking about where the water tastes like summer and rain and, and all those good things, and nice and cool uh, inside of these uh, pieces of pottery. But, but how lovely. And uh, we thought that definitely this style, uh, because we have shown Scraffito work, we have shown um, micaceous pottery, uh, especially micaceous pottery that you can actually cook in, and some of this corrugated ware and carving. And we're trying to do all the techniques that um, potters do with their pieces. And if you notice in our schedule, we do not have any Hopi or Navajo potters because the virus has impacted them greatly. And for some of the Navajo potters, and definitely for all the um, Hopi potters, they all come from out of state. And we have strict rules that our governor, um, by the way, who spoke last night at the Democratic Convention, she has imposed lots of regulations for us, and if you come from out of state, you are to self-quarantine for two weeks. So the industry, the, to the tourist industry here is virtually null and void, but you know, that's gonna change soon, I'm sure, once all of this is sort of over with. But we've had many potters who have called us and said, gee, that looks like fun, can I do it too? And we thought that as Time went on since we have invested in all the equipment and we have all these wonderful people who were willing to talk to us and, and tell us the stories of their life uh, that uh, we would continue doing them. But we're gonna take a break to probably do some editing and then uh, we will continue on. If you missed the pieces from, uh, or the demonstrations, from the 12 previous ones that we've recorded, they're available to you. If you go to youtube.com and then search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, 
you will see our um, channel and the channel has all 12 of the pieces that you can watch at your leisure. And people have asked how long will they be up there. Well, I think probably forever, uh, maybe a little less, but probably forever. And uh, you can tune in and watch again. Now, the one with Jackie, in case you know you have to run to the grocery store or, or go pick up your kids somewhere and miss a chunk of it, uh, you uh, can see this one uh, today about two hours after we finish. Well, I'm over here with Jackie, and Jackie uh, has her, uh, her things. And uh, Jackie, what can you tell me about these guys? Uh, well, this is my coordinated work here. This is the, the coil method that I do. So these are all pretty much, they're all mostly white. Um, I do have some pieces that will be fired, but here's a piece right here. And it's all done in the coil method, as I was demonstrating over there at the table. I start from the bottom, so you see how the coils go. And as I'm coiling, then I go back and I do my stamping, which I use a, a, a wooden tool. So then I get to this point here, and then I add several coils again, so I keep layering it, then I go back, so I'm stamping. Go back again, add more coils, and start doing the shaping of what pot I want to do. Yeah, this particular one is a bowl, which has the fluted top, as you can see. And you can also see, like, in the inside of the pot, where you still see the coils coming, coming out. So it's not, it's not necessarily all smoothed out, but it's it's smoothed out, so it gives it the shape of the pot. And as you get to the top, then that's where you you add your your rim. And say for instance, this one I want it to be fluted. So as the clay is still wet, then you're working and shaping the lip of the the pot. So that's what it looks like. Then so a long time ago, these would be used for cooking, correct? Yeah. Certain bowls like this where it has a bigger opening, like the, the bigger top, they were used as cooking. So when, they, when it came time to cooking, you're putting this on the fire. That's where I, I was talking about, like the indentations you see here. The flames would go into these indentations and it heats up the the, uh, the water you're cooking a lot faster whereas you have a, a smooth piece that's just completely smooth say like for instance something like this here or this see the smooth surface the flames would just go around it so it's it's not, it doesn't heat up as fast it doesn't cook as fast as a pot like this with the corrugated indentions well, uh, and also, so my understanding of it is the corrugated adds surface area, and so there's more surface that is able to warm up, whereas a smooth pot has not nearly as much surface. Right, right, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, um, and then I have a, a, a couple of questions. You know, we would find pottery shards many, many years ago, uh, or not many years ago, but, you know, in Mesa Verde area with this corrugated ware, and they'd always be black. And I, I believe the black was actually from the use of the cooking being burnt in the fire. Yeah. But uh, today we buy our cookware, correct? Mm -hmm. And so these are, even though they are meant uh, to, to be as cookware, they are not to be used as cookware. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Well, now, now, nowadays now, it's used as more of a decorative piece, um, but they still can be used as cooking um, to this day. But 
but it would destroy the yeah, color, the color of, it. of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it would probably destroy the piece after a short period of use. Mm -hmm. And for the people at home, it's difficult for uh, the people at home to make another one. Whereas Jackie here, I, I'm sure, could probably <laughs> make another one if she wanted to. But uh, we, we just want to remind everybody yeah. that even though these were used for cooking many, many, many years ago, that we should not use them today as cookware. Right, right. It's more of a decorative piece mm -hmm. of art. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell me about these with the two spouts? Okay, so we're talking about the wedding vase. This here is a wedding vase. It's done the same way in a corrugated um, style. You see that there's the handle and the two spouts. And what do those represent? So it's called the wedding vase. And the two spouts represent, on this side will be the groom, and on the right side will be for the bride. And what they do, and actually we still do this in, in, to this date in our traditional way, where you put medicine in the, uh, in the vase. So then when the medicine is in the vase, so the groom will drink out of this spout, and the bride would drink out of this spout, spout here. The band here represents the bonding of the two. So that's why it's called the wedding vase. And uh, it looks like for the wedding vase, you made kind of a jar, and then you made the connector piece, mm -hmm. and then you made the two spouts. Right. Yeah, so you have to, so what I do is make this part here, so I add, a section here, then I add the the nozzles uh, for the for the vase, and then the last thing we do is to connect the band together. And then, of course, this one here has the design on there, the polychrome design, the orange, and then the the brown and black. Okay, and then you have some jars down here that uh, have some handles on them. And what are, what are the use for the handles? For these ones here? Yeah. Okay, this is called a canteen, uh, known also as a water jug. And what we used it was to store water in. And back in our, our days when we were doing a lot of farming and, and um, or even going to, to tend to your sheep or cattle, they would make these water jugs so then they have the handles on there with the spout. So with the spout, that's the part where you drink out of, and they used to get either a corn cob or a piece of cottonwood and plug the spout with, so they hauled it on their horseback or on the wagon and stuff. And then with the handles, they tied leather straps. So you could either put it over your shoulder too, or um, use, use the handles with the straps to hang it onto your horse, the saddle. So that's what that was made for. But it is a drinking vessel. And just to remind people you shouldn't drink out of it these right. days because they will eventually dissolve. But actually in their dissolving, they it forms a function. And the function is, is that the water seeps uh, to the outside of the piece because they're not high fired, they're not glazed, mm -hmm. so they don't hold water. The water eventually will seep out to the front right. or to the outside surface. It then evaporates uh, from the outside surface, kind of like a, very similar to a swamp cooler, and cools the interior for a nice cool drink of water. So uh, not only was it functional in a lot of ways, uh, it was uh, something that was uh, early refrigeration techniques. Right. Yep, that's how they had, the, like uh, Derek said, the refrigeration and the water will stay cold in this. But like today, nowadays, it's also used as a decorative piece. So, you know, I don't recommend that you store water in, in you know, in them for long, for any period of time. Yeah, we don't recommend you put water in any Native American pots, except for one artist, which is Clarence Cruz. Uh, and he is somebody who fires in a way that uh, allows it to be usable in its micaceous play. 
Well, Jackie, have we talked about the black and white pieces? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Well, I see one that is just going round and round and round, and it looks like that there are just a gazillion bugs all over it. <laughs> Does it come with a can of raid? <laughs> this one, this particular piece here is called a member's pot. And the reason it's called members pot is because it has the little characters on here, all these different animals, insects, um, birds, you see, fish, rabbits. Back then, um, a lot of our ancestors used to um, uh, do the, the polychrome painted pots, and they used to use a lot of the figurines, stuff that they would go hunt for or just things that were around the home stuff. Of course, you see there's the, the parrot, uh, the turkey, and you see the ram. Then, of course, you, you always have grasshoppers and ants, and down here is a bear, lizard. So a lot of the designs, it reflects back to, as they were growing up, what they uh, experienced, their animals or it, it was kind of like a storybook for them, and, and they did. They used to talk uh, and tell stories about these characters. Maybe they had an adventure with one or the other, or they got bit by an ant, or, but, and then it just flows into like a, almost like, a, like I said, a storybook um, type of uh, history. Then you have the, the, of course, the design here, which you know, re represents um, like your fields, your road, your water. It can re represent those those uh, themes. And um, a lot of this design here you saw on members' pots, you know, a lot of the old pieces. Well, the, the members' people um, lived in southern New Mexico, southern Arizona, mm -hmm. and apparently at from my understanding is that when the climate changed around the, between 800 and 1200, mm -hmm. uh, in the common era, uh, the Membrace people hightailed it out of town and they went, <laughs> and they went north to right. where you are today because the living conditions were better. Right. And uh, so these, are the, the Membrace people are your um, ancestors. Exactly. And um, not only did they bring their stuff with them, they also brought their designs with them as well. And there are a few people who stu still do Membrace designs on their pieces of pottery. And I think that, you know, they are charming and lovely and, um, and also, you know, the, the, the idea that the language is not written and the only way that you pass the language and the culture from one generation to another is to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And you'll see figures, and we're going to have two Akama storytellers uh, demonstrating next week. One is Judy Lewis and the other one is her sister Marilyn Ray. Okay. And uh, but they tell the stories of the culture and oftentimes the stories have to do with animals. Uh, and the animals are the clever ones or the animals are the sneaky ones or the animals are the ones that get into trouble. <laughs> and it's yeah. yeah, it's a way of the of to learn the culture in a very palatable way uh, because, you know, there are no written texts. And the storytellers, the, the person who passes that information on uh, is, is usually a grandparent because just like every other, you know, culture, that generation in between is too busy working. So grandma and grandpa take over that function. Yeah. And so when you see storytellers here in, in Santa Fe that are from the Southwest, uh, some people call them storyteller dolls. Well, they're not dolls. They are not playthings. Uh, what they are is sort of uh, figures that honor grandparents 
who take on the responsibility of teaching their grandchildren mm -hmm. um, the uh, the culture and uh, what has happened to their people in the, in the past. Uh, now I see that pot has something else with it, and if you could grab it here, let me move this one mm -hmm. and. Tell us what that's okay. all about. Well, in uh, actually last year, I attended an art show in Farmington. And it was my first time I've ever did this show, so they, uh, I found out it was a judging competition. So I entered this piece here, and it wound up taking uh, the best of show at the competition. So that was really like, I was so excited. And yeah, congratulations. How often this. does that happen yeah. to anyone? Right? Uh huh. So I was so excited about that, but this is the ribbon that it came with. And so. it's the ribbon that will come with the pot if someone chooses to, 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 to own purchase. it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, how nice, how nice. And I just love all these creepy crawly things that are on that pot. Now, obviously, that one just going by was an ant. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the other bugs? Okay, so now this one here is going to be the turkey. Uh huh. Here's a ram. We have the ram, and we have the turtle. And this one here is the badger. That's a badger. There's your smelly ant. thing, mean yeah. smelly things, aren't they? Uh -huh. um, and then we have the the grasshopper down here, and another grasshopper. Down in the bottom, we have a bear fetish, the lizard. We have a fish. Actually, that one was a shark. This is a fish. Shark. Yeah. I mean, like a shark that's in the Rio yeah. Grande River? It's a river shark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a river shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you have the turtle, and there's the ant just went by. Then we have a quail on this side that's coming around. Here's the quail. Well, so. well it is just a menagerie of local... Uh, no, flora, fauna, of local fauna, <laughs> uh, except for the shark. Yeah, except for the, the shark. shark. I was looking I mean, at, yeah, see how what? Uh, uh, I don't, let's say it's a tuna. <laughs> well, there, there we have the deer. Yeah. So these, and these creatures are, are these designs I've seen on, um, like I said, on old members' pots. Yeah. You know, their plates. A lot of them were on plates that they, I guess, ate off of or served on. So or bowls. Most, yeah. Mm -hmm. And bowls, too. Yes, but it's really a wonderful piece. Now, tell me about the other black and white one. Okay. So we have this one here. Let this me just piece. move in here a little. There, I'm getting to camera, so if anybody is wondering why it's all doing all kinds of weird things, it's because of me. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, a large base with the fluted top. I And the other piece that you saw also had the fluted top, and that was one of my new, uh, I would say, creations that I started doing. Instead of having the smooth, straight surface top, I was doing the fluted top where it sways. So this is a large base here, and again, you have the member's designs on them with the, uh, the traditional uh, designs that you see here, the squares mm -hmm. that run in a, in, a, in a design, almost like a swirl. And this piece also has a, a ribbon on it. Yeah, you're quite an award-winning yeah. gal, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. And what's that one from? This one here is from Red Earth. This, this show that I did in um, is it Oklahoma? the Red Earth uh, Indian Art Show, and it took a third place on this, this piece here. So that's what the, the white ribbon it represents. Well, you know how interesting the painted pieces are, especially with the, those medallions with the, the membrane designs on it, and how well they go with your corrugated 
pieces. I mean, they look really, really, really nice together. I mean, we thought about what well, we should maybe the painted ones we should put in a separate place, but uh -huh. I think combining them, they're they're really quite wonderful. Now, did you talk about this one that has? Neither paint nor corrugation at all? Okay, this piece, this particular piece is also a new design that I started doing. And it's all white. I did do a coil around it. So this is actually a new version of my work. And of course you see the, the, the top is not even, it's uh, sort of fluted. But what's different about this one here is I added mica uh, slip to it. Now, what's what's mica? Mica is like a gyps, a Egyptian um, gypsum. It comes from the Egyptian mine. Is it, am I saying that right? Gypsum. Gypsum. So uh -huh. if you see when I when I um, put the white slip on, I added the the mica to the slip. So you see these little sparkles here. Little it kind sparkles. Of almost looks uh -huh. like gold chips in it mm -hmm. so that's what gives it that nice nice look then you, you also see i did add corrugated so it has the combination of the corrugation and it just ha it has a real nice shape to it so you can see how it looks so this was actually blended into the pot the coil so you just smooth it down like that but this is a mm -hmm. nice piece, though. Well, Jackie, I, you know, your work is really wonderful and very unique. And within the, the parameters, parameters of your family, I mean, you can see what Grandma and, and Mama uh, all did. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. These were all um, uh, pieces in, in my, my work. Um, that I learned from my mom and my grandmother. So I am going to ask you a couple questions okay. and I'm wondering, there's a whole bunch of different shapes that are over here right. on the display. What is your favorite shape to make? My favorite pieces to make are the wedding vases. Mm -hmm. and, and is it is it because uh, you knew somebody or is it because it's, is it because the shape is actually just fun to make? The shape is fun to make. It's also it's also a little bit tedious because you're working and, and adding your handles, your your uh, nozzles and stuff. So it, it's for me it's more um, more carefulness with the clay. Um, but I enjoy making the wedding vases, and then of course I also enjoy making um, my owls. You know, the, the owls right here that I have. And those are fun characters to make. Those are so fun, especially when you start adding the wings and, and uh, the nose and the eyes. And that, those were fun pieces. Those are fun pieces to do also. Okay, well, thank you very much for showing me all of this stuff. Um, um, I am about to turn it back over to Andrea, so she is going to tell you a little bit about the schedule and what is going on. So let her get set for one second. Well, you know, Derek, I wonder if we had, we, I think we have a few questions. I think we have a few questions from uh, uh, people that are on YouTube. Well, the only question that I see here is what an elegant clock. It's a comment. Yeah, was there something about dusting? Uh, there was. Somebody wanted to know about how we dust pieces of pottery in the gallery. So how do you dust pieces of pottery in a gallery? <laughs> as little as possible. Uh, or we ask someone else to do it. No. Uh, the, way we, the way we dust things is that uh, we like to use Swiffers because they're really soft and, they, and, the, and if there's any dust clinging to them, that we, uh, 
just wipe them, you know, with the, the, the Swiffer. If there's something like a corrugated pot or something that is very, very deeply carved and the Swiffer isn't getting into those particular places, uh, we use the can of air. But you have to be a little careful with that can of air because at some point some very, very cold liquid comes out of it and you really don't want that on your pieces of pottery. But please never, never put them in the dishwasher. Uh, don't wash them in the sink. Water is the enemy of American Indian pottery. Uh, and if they are unbelievably dirty, the easiest thing to do is to call your local museum that might have some Native American potter, pottery and ask them if there is someone who does repair or restoration in your area uh, and uh, talk to them about how you should clean it. Like for example, if your grandson spills a jar of grape jelly inside of one of your pots, how do you, how do you get that out of there without damaging uh, the pieces? And um, if you don't have that sort of um, facility or uh, that possibility in your area. If you're coming to Santa Fe, bring the pot and I'll clean it for you. And I like doing that, but I really don't share that information about how I do it because uh, I don't want anyone ruining something that might have a lot of uh, dollar value or sentimental value. And so we, um, we you know, just use our Swiffer as much as possible. Now we have two gallery dogs and Honey, who has very, very long hair, has this enormous tail, but it's really skinny on the inside and all the rest of it is hair. And there's a certain level that when she walks by, uh, her um, tail sort of acts as a feather duster. But the tail is so fine that it, you know, it doesn't break the pots at all. And people laugh when uh, they see the dogs roaming around the, uh, the gallery thinking that they are um, endangering the artwork here. But uh, actually, they are adding to it. And Honey adds to it in a very special way. I hope that answers uh, your question about how we keep them clean. So uh, we found that Swiffers are the best. Oh, and also, don't let the cleaning lady do, do anything because um, what we hear about breakage and problems with pottery usually has to do with the cleaning lady, not the cat, not the grandchildren. So don't let her wipe anything off with a damp rag. That is just not a good idea at all. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the culprit cleaning lady. One time I saw a piece of pottery that Dextra made and Dextra Kotskovia from Hopi was a, is a, was a really famous, famous potter. And uh, one time she made a pot that was beautifully executed. And in the pot on either side was a handprint. And the handprint was painted with fine lines. It was gorgeous. And then there was a very delicate three-dimensional ear of corn on the side. And when I asked her about the pot, she said she called it the cleaning lady pot so that you could put your hand in the handprints, pick the pot up and move it and dust underneath and then put the pot back in place so that you wouldn't drop it and, and break it. And the concept of a cleaning lady at the Pueblo of Hopi is um, a really interesting, is really interesting. But uh, like I said before, the best way to clean them is a Swiffer, a soft cloth, and really nothing else. Uh, anyway, let me tell you about what's coming up because we have more potters. We have seven more that you'll be able to see. The first one 
tomorrow is Carolyn Concho. And Carolyn does membrane designs that uh, Jackie was talking about. This one with the butterfly. And what's really interesting about Carolyn's piece is that she often does a three-dimensional part of the animal. This particular shape is a seed pot. Uh, seed pots were originally used to store seeds. They had a hole that was the size of a corn cob. You could put your seeds in in the fall, put the corn cob in. That way it was dry and dark and the mice weren't going to eat your seeds. And then the following season, you pull out the corn cob, shake out the seeds, and uh, do a bunch of rain dances and hope for the best. But what Carolyn does with her seed pots, you know, they grew smaller and smaller uh, and became more and more decorative as time went on because uh, first there were seed catalogs and traders and, and grocery stores, and so storing seeds didn't become a, a you know, a life and death matter anymore. But she does a little three-dimensional work. There's even a little ladybug on the other side. But with seed pots and with plates and with membrane designs and all natural paints, including the pieces that have coloration in them. She'll be here between 11 and 4 tomorrow, mountain time. Then, the following day, on Saturday, we'll have Sammy Naranjo and his um, significant other, Melanie Gutierrez. They do sgraffito work, uh, really very delicate work. Uh, she, he does it on containers, and she does the sgraffito work on turtles, on the turtle shells, which is really fun. And they'll be here from 1 to 4 uh, Mountain Time on Saturday. Now, for our final week of doing this, uh, Tuesday through Saturday of next week, on Tuesday we will have Candelaria Suazo. She will also be here from 11 to 4, like Carolyn, and she does sgraffito work also, but with lots and lots of animals and uh, really lovely, lovely pieces. And then on Wednesday, and I'm not going to go any further than Wednesday, we'll have Angie Yazzie from Taos Pueblo, who makes these paper, paper, paper thin pots. I mean, they are so light, it's just, I mean, a, a pot that's 30 inches in diameter, I can easily pick it up and carry it around if, you know, as though I were um, carrying a, a, you know, a a bag of groceries. I mean, they're just, they're so, a small bag of groceries. They're just so light. It's really, really amazing. And she does reduction firing and just plain wood firing of my caseous uh, pottery. And she has won more awards at Indian Market than anyone can ever imagine. And she'll be here from one until three on next Wednesday. Anyway, uh, that's the future for these demos. The past, the 12 that we have recorded before that are available on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. Uh, we have our own channel. They'll all come up. You can watch them in their entirety if you choose. And, uh, the one from today will be posted about two hours after um, we conclude here today. But uh, today uh, we have Jackie Shativa from Acomo Pueblo, who uniquely does the corrugated wear, the wear that she learned from her mama, uh, Stella Shativa, and her grandma, Jessie Garcia. Both of those ladies were very, very important in the um, history of Acoma pottery and very well known and very, very collectible. We have both Jesse's and Stella's pieces here as well as uh, so many of Jackie's. And the reason that we're doing this basically is because uh, the largest con congregation, I, you might call them, of Native Americans uh, is 
was canceled, Indian market that usually takes place on the third weekend of August here in Santa Fe. And so uh, consequently, uh, so many of our potters uh, do not have a source of income. I mean, there's no unemployment insurance or you don't get a check from the government because you've contributed uh, into the social security and Medicare system because they're all independent, self, um, you know, they're, they're self-employed. And uh, that really, really makes a, a big difference when their main source of income is cut away. And if you notice, Jackie talked about the places where she exhibited her work in, in Kansas and uh, in, in various places and received awards and ribbons. Well, all of those opportunities have been canceled also. And so by buying their pieces, you really, really support the artist. And uh, it will, it, you know, will truly make a difference in their lives. And, you know, that's the reason why, why we're doing all this. So, you know, if you would like to help them out, uh, this is a very, very convenient way. And in return, you get something really beautiful to display in your home. So we have Jackie back. And I got a question from the internet. And the, the question is from, uh, well, I'm not sure. Oh, excuse me, it's from Charles. And she, he says that we have a wedding vase made by Jackie's grandmother, Jessie Garcia. And we have been unable to locate a picture of Jessie and would appreciate any information you might be able to provide about Jessie. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I'll have to look into um, some of my photos. Sister. In fact, I think I have a picture of her while she was making a piece. Oh, nice, so nice. So maybe you could make a copy yeah, of it or, so if or, I can find or it. take a picture of the picture and yeah. email it to Charles. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. And then um, any other information I find, I can get it to Derek and then De Derek can forward it to Charles. Great. Does, uh, do you know if her picture has been published in any books? Um, I'm not sure if she was published herself, but I know some of her work was in uh, some of the um, older books that came out for uh, Southwest Pottery. Um, I'm not sure the name of the books, but there were several of her pieces in, in some of those books, which was, uh, I believe, the last one I saw was about in the uh, early 80s edition uh -huh. of the Southwest uh, Pueblo Potters. So. Uh -huh. Well, I know there's a really nice picture of you and your mom oh, in um, Talking with the Clay, mm -hmm. uh, the book that Stephen Trimble wrote. When we have Talking with the Clay here, uh, if anyone is interested, both in soft and hardcover, and, uh, but a real, real nice picture of the, the two of you together a long, long yes, time that, ago. That's been a while back. Yeah, because that book is about 25 years old. Uh, the first edition is about 25 years old. Uh -huh. Do you have another question? And there's also an update to that Talking with the Clay book, a 20 or 25 year revision. 20 year. Yeah, 20 year revision. Yep, and so we have a, it's actually a question for Andrea, and it says- The answer is yes. Yeah, hey, and that's, and that's the right answer. Uh, uh, I hope that, this is from Joan. Joan says that I hope that after market you'll still do the virtual live stream demonstrations for the people like me who are out of state. Well, actually we are going to do them, but uh, doing 20 of them in a row has turned out to be really difficult because for someone like me who has to talk for five hours, I thought I could talk, you know, for a, a million years. It wouldn't be so bad. But after five hours of talking, it's really exhausting. And so after the month of August, and uh, because of people like you who are kind enough to say that um, you, are in, you like watching these and getting all this information, we end with artists who have called us and said, it really looks like fun. Can I do one too? 
uh, we uh, decided that we will continue on with these. But we're probably going to have a, a break for a while. I think I'm going to go sit in a cave somewhere and not say a word <laughs> for a while. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we will resume them. And if you noticed on our schedule, and the complete schedule is at and, uh, andreafisherpottery.com slash 2020. Uh, if you notice, there are no Hopi or Navajo potters uh, on our list, only because uh, the greater part of the Navajo reservation and all the Hopi reservation is in the state of Arizona. And our governor has... Uh, Mm. Well, she's that she's more than requested that uh, everyone who is from out of state to um, stay away for uh, two weeks, to stay indoors for two weeks, to quarantine for two weeks before you can, uh, you know, go. You can go out into New Mexico, and consequently, that has you know made the the city of Santa Fe, a tourist de destination, pretty close to a ghost town at this point. But uh, this too will pass, and when it does, uh, we will um, be able to have some of the Navajo and Hopi potters join us. Now, uh, Jackie, question. Yes. How <clears throat> is the, the virus affecting Acomo Pueblo? Um, it's... it's Right now, we're still on restriction. Um, we do have a, a curfew. And um, so we're pretty much tight down. You know, we have to be back within the reservation if anybody is to go out and get their necessities or go do daily chores or take their kids to appointments or go to appointments. We have a curfew set for 8 o'clock. So, eight o'clock. So uh oh, what day. happens if you're not home by eight o'clock? Um, they will may sometimes either give you a warning or there you'll get a citation. And and how much does it cost? To... I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing they have a restriction on is having your children go off the reservation, so your kids aren't allowed to leave the reservation, the pueblo, and um, they've gotten to a point where they've had to check the trunks of parents who, you know, make sure kids won't... Check the trunks? Yeah, it's like almost like... I mean, lock, locking, your, back and forth, locking your kid in the trunk? Yeah. Oh, that's a plan. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> There's many a times I would have loved to have been able to do that, virus or no virus. <laughs> but yeah, they, that, that's the restriction. So, and then, of course, the elders, you know, they... They keep them home and stuff. So, well, have the, you had many positive test cases? Uh, right now, we've only, we've uh, had tests done, and I believe uh, we've only had four cases of deaths on our pueblo uh -huh. um, due to the corona. But they also had uh, other issues, you yeah. know. So that was part of that, and. Um, some tested, of course, uh, positive, so they were quarantined for the 14 days. And, mm -hmm. and anybody that made contact with them, um, same thing would take place. So we're, we've been, uh, since March, since the beginning of this, we've yeah. been on, uh, on curfew, you mm -hmm. know. So from, five in, <clears throat> from 8 o'clock in the evening until 5 in the morning, you know. So you can leave at 5 a.m. Yeah. if you have a, yeah. um, a job that right. is yeah. necessary. Yeah, and if you do work like off the reservation or if you're living uh, in town and have to work on the reservation, you have to have a, a letter stating that, you know, you yeah. so that you can come in and off. Now, uh, could I just come by and visit you? <sighs> I uh, know. No, no stop that would be a no. Right? They would stop at the. You, there's and the thing about this is we only have one entrance in and out. Uh huh. So if you live in the far end of the village, uh, you have to come to the front end of the the village to get to in get and in out. and out. Uh -huh. That's the only access we have. All the entrances have been blocked off. Um, they have um, uh, barriers up. So, uh -huh. 
They've been keeping No mom and machine guns? Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, good, good. Thank That's goodness. good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been, um, been kind of hard. I yeah. Because you can't, can't go anywhere. Can't, you have to be back at a certain time. And so how do you spend the day? Um, working on pottery. Uh -huh. Just we've been actually we've been doing um, uh, yard work. You know, yeah. we've, a lot of people have been doing their chores that they put back for so long and bringing them back out. And yeah, over. I know. I cleaned out my garage. That was the first time that garage has been touched in 15 years. <laughs> right. uh -huh. And then uh, my husband and I, we've been doing remodeling for families. Um, uh -huh. Uh, we were asked to do an addition, so we did an addition to a home. We did some decks, uh, outdoor backyard decks for several people. Uh -huh. So we've been keeping ourselves yeah, busy. busy. Do you have a garden? I have a small garden, yeah. Uh -huh. So I planted uh, pumpkin, c corn, uh, beets, just vegetables, yeah. you know, onions, onions, radishes. So I have my little garden going. Yeah, well, that's keeps, good. Keeps us busy. I mean, there's lots of gardens that are sprouting up in New Mexico. And one of the things that um, I heard about the city of Santa Fe is the water consumption has gone up so much because everybody's watering their yeah. their tomatoes and yeah. all the other things and that what, that they're growing. What was surprising is that um, this year or this this time that we've seen so many uh, corn fields being planted, you know, so, uh -uh. and last year, the year before, you just see one here, one there. This year, you see them all over, you know, yeah. which is nice to yeah, see that. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to see that people are back into doing a little bit of farming, and then, of course, our our tribal uh, field officers, they have their, the tribal or the field chiefs uh, have their garden, and it's dry farming, but we've had so much rain you know, coming that it's... You've really had enough rain there? Oh, it's been it's dry as a bone down. here. Yeah, it's, it's been it's dry as a bone. Yeah, I'm yeah. surprised that we've gotten that much rain. But it's yeah. nice. It's it's nice to see that. So you're not using, you know, your your water. And, and of course, the irrigation, you have to ditch irrigation and yeah. stuff that they used to. The precious water from mm -hmm. New Mexico. Yeah. That's the only thing we don't have here, but don't tell anyone, because <laughs> all the other things are really good. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you have to spend your whole life drinking Diet Coke, uh, what the heck, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no water. Yeah. Do we have another question, Derek? No, we do not. Not yet. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, let me just change the cameras real quick for Jack. Well, Jackie, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, what's going on in the Pueblo and okay. family life in the, the Pueblo. But Derek wants to sit and talk for a little while. Okay. So what are you doing there? Right now I'm working on the smooth pot. Um, I'm going to bring it up a little bit more. And I, ha I just got um, done doing the stamping on the, the coil pot here. See, I started from the center and worked myself out. And, and what was the stamp that you used? It's actually a tool that my mother had. And it's, it's a, a wooden tool. And it's almost shaped like a, a deer hoof. So I used the back side of it. So when I'm doing my um, stamping, I start from the center. And I just press down. And as you're pressing down, you're kind of overlapping on the the bottom part of the coil. So that's what gives it the hold to, to stay together. So I've gotten this far now, and what I'm going to do is, in a, in a little while, is turn it over and start working on the outside. So this is, this is how I started off, start off, is a flat surface. And I'll actually show you before I get to this one here. So I'm going to turn it over. And you see how it's kind of smooth, but you still see the coils. So mm -hmm. that's going to go there. And I use um, bow bases, uh, almost like dessert dishes as bases. Uh, do you call it a pookie or just a base? Yeah, just a, a pookie. Um, I can't remember the word for it. 
but um, just a, a small base to start the, the process of shaping. So then I place it in the bowl and then I slightly press it downward into the bowl. And you keep a paper towel underneath it? Yes, so, for, so because it is, it is glass, it won't stick. Mm. So the paper towel keeps it from sticking to the bowl. And does the paper towel need to be wet at all, or is it no, dry? No, it's dry because the, the wetness of the clay will get it wet. And you don't want the clay to stay wet. You want Once you start building up on it as the base, you want it to start drying as you're working up work. So, and, the, and the, with the paper towel, and sometimes on my bigger pieces, I use uh, cloth. So what it does is it absorbs the, the moisture and kind of helps the pot dry out as you're going up. Because when you're building, <clears throat> when you're building your pot, as you're going upward, you want it to be um, stable. You don't want it to be wet because if, if you start keep working on it as it keeps going, it's going to tend to fall in, especially when you start layering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what I'm doing now is just starting out my base. I'm going to let it sit for a little bit so it can dry to where I can be able to put the next coil on. And so uh, you did flip it over with the texture already on the bottom, yes. correct? Yes. So it's and so the texture is on the bottom, and so it still remains there. Yes. So it's, even when I start smoothing it out, you'll see the, the corrugated on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily press too hard to where you're going to bring out the, the indentation, just enough to start shaping your bow. So that's where that one stands. Now this one that you were, you had asked me about, it's the smooth surface bowl. Mm -hmm. So as you see here, it's still, I try to make my, um, my pots thin as possible. So right now what I'm doing is I'm actually trying to lift uh, the clay up. take out some of the, the thickness on it and just kind of stretch it and stretch, work it a little. Yeah, stretch the clay out. And this part of my hands is basically my, my um, like my feelers. I feel the, the thickness with the clay and the, the, the wood that I'm shaping with. To, and it kind of gives me the, the feeling of how thick and how much further I can pull up on the clay you go too far, it tends to get thin and possibility that it might go through. So you just fill with your hand and you start lifting the clay if you can, I don't know if you can see how it starts lifting up. Yeah, I think people can see that. And if you can't see anything or uh, you want to see something specific, just type it into the YouTube chat window and I will uh, do my best to be able to get everybody uh, answered. Okay, so I did lift it up maybe about a half an inch more. So then now I'm going back to the inside and shaping it. And you can see that on the inside of my hand, I can feel the wood applying a little bit of pressure, but just to enough to get it to shape. So, uh, and you want to you you want to keep your pots thin because uh, in having the pots thin, uh, it means you have to go collect less clay. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, Alcoma pottery is known for being able to go relatively thin uh, because there is a lot of the pottery shards that are added to the, to the clay, to the which clay. gives it that temper, yeah. which gives it the structure uh, that it needs to go thin as well. Right, yeah. So you can see, you can basically see how the, the thickness of it is. That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how much, pretty much how thin it's going to go. And I see you're not using a wheel or uh, anything besides just a coil. 
just the coil method and these are these here are my tools mm -hmm. for shaping and, and and building the pots and then this is the tool that I used to stamp with um, I have tried using a wheel and I I was so frustrated <laughs> and you know the I, I took a class just to experience what it, how to, and figuring, well, maybe I can use a wheel. No. It didn't work? It didn't work. And I'm like, my clay was going here, it was going there. I'm like, okay, I'll go back to what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you're obviously very good at what you do. So, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's great that you were trying to learn and try yeah. something new. And I just got a question, and the question is from Dan in San Diego. And Dan would like to know, uh, after seeing the piece of, by Jesse Garcia, your grandmother, uh -huh. uh, did Jesse do corrugated pieces before Jackie's mother, uh, Stella? Uh, or was it after? It was after. Oh, so, so my mom so, was probably te uh, at the time teaching her mom how to do the corrugated. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an experience knowing that my mom's teaching her mother how to do something for yeah. change. <laughs> well, there's, there's been a few then, examples of that in the pottery yeah. world. For instance, Joseph Lone Wolf from uh -huh. Santa Clara Pueblo really popularized the very fine, detailed sgraffito work. And then uh, his dad, Camilio, started doing the same kind of fine, detailed sgraffito work. Before that, he made big pots, and uh -huh. Joseph did small ones small. that were really fine and, and well done. And so there are lots of examples of that where, you know, uh, they, can, they, they see something that's a little different and new and that is working, that people do change. And uh, that is one great thing, is that there is always change happening in something that is so traditional. Right. Yeah. And that was like with, with my mom and her mom when she was... Um, she took interest in seeing what my mom was doing. She goes, well, let me try that. So they, they were, my mom would go down to visit um, her mom who lived in a, in a uh, village just a little ways down from where we lived. Mm -hmm. And because um, we have several villages in, in our Pueblo. So they would go down there and she would show her how. And, and like it's one of the pieces that you've seen here today that they were showing. <clears throat> she had... She was starting to learn how to do the corrugation. Well, I mean, and the corrugation is always different. I mean, you can almost tell instantly whose corrugation it and, is yeah. because of the shape of the corrugation. And Jesse's kind of have these wide triangles, uh -huh. whereas you kind of have these narrow, deep triangles. Uh -huh. And still it kind of has in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, and that's, that was, that's funny because people would say, we have one of your mom's pieces. And I'm like, okay. And I would look at it and say, yeah. That's mom's piece, and it, it was, it was, and it, you know, there was a time when, um, after uh, my mom had passed, and when we were both making pottery together, sitting at the table, and, and um, she would say, you know, um, so I'm daughter, so one of these days, we need to trade. Uh, you make me a piece, and I'll make you a piece. So we said, okay. And, um, well, I hope that happened before she passed. It, it never did. Oh, I'm sorry to hear yeah, that. Yeah, it never did. But, you know, she had some pieces that were flaw, uh, that had flaws in them. So she, she would let me take them before she could crush them back up and reuse them. I would swipe them away from her. <laughs> I said, I'll take this. So I see you're doing a different method. Um, the, the first piece that you were doing the coils with, you made a very thin coil, like uh -huh. a piece of pasta. And this one, I see you made a thicker coil and you're tapping it down. Yeah, it's still in, a, in the coil method because what I'm going to do is I'm adding on to the smooth pot here. So I, wrote, I still rolled it into a coil and then I, I'm patting it down and I see an air bubble. So I, I have a little knife here that I press down on the on the air pockets. So I'm and pressing. What happens if you don't get the air pockets out? It'll pop uh, in the firing. That's where you know your uh, where your flaws are at. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it out, but if, even if like when you're smoothing the pot out too, you'll you'll tend to find it. 
but sometimes it doesn't happen where you just kind of go over it, but the pocket's still in there, the air pocket. So when it comes time for firing, because the pressure builds up in that pocket, it'll pop. So you you have a sort of like a blowout on yeah. the piece. And do you fire one piece at a time, or do you do I, many at a time? I do several, mm -hmm. several pieces. And are you using a kiln or traditional methods? I'm still studying the traditional method. I've tried the, the traditional method, um, and I still like to try to do that but for now I'm doing the, the kiln firing and um, most people because um, they see our pieces that are all white and when I did the, the outdoor firing you had the burnishes in them mm -hmm. and those were kind of hard to sell because they said well it's not all why is it not all white why because it? it's a traditional firing so those tend to be the hardest pieces to sell, even though you try to explain to them that it's done traditionally and it's done the, the way we do the firing of the, the pots. Yeah, so um, uh, just to back up for our viewers, um, so Acoma Pueblo generally has moved away from the traditional firing methods uh, because of what exactly what Jackie was talking about right here, which is fire clouds or burn marks or mm -hmm. discolorations coming from the, uh, uh, the, the, the unevenness of a natural fire in, in the ground. Um, and those, because Acoma pieces are based in white, effectively the market has demanded that, uh, that these black and white or perfect designs are, are that perfect. And so because of that, uh, I, I believe that Acoma pottery has moved away mainly from traditional firing methods. And there's, st there's only a few people today who still know how to fire traditionally. Um, so you've fired traditionally before? Yes, I have, yeah. And, and of course my mom, that's how she did most of her firing was all traditional. So when she was doing the traditional firing, we were the ones who were going to gather her materials to do her firing, which of course was, she used um, the uh, cow dung mm -hmm. for her firing. Yeah, so I've seen it done with sheep's dung, with cow's yeah. dung, with horse dung. Um, and it actually takes a surprisingly long time to fire traditionally. Yes, um, the fire sometimes can burn for a few hours. Oh yeah, it actually we've, um, from start to finish, because you're still having, you're building the kiln basically. Mm -hmm. You know, with the, the corn gun and, and just having to set it um, from beginning to start is a long process. Firing itself takes anywhere probably from uh, three to six hours mm -hmm. from start, once it starts burning to, to when it cools down. So it, 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 there is a, it's a long process. Sometimes I think it's more harder than you know, because you're sitting waiting with the kiln, whereas for the pit firing, you know, you're kind of watching and making sure um, when you're doing firings like that, the day is perfect, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want wind, the wind coming in, you know, and that's how you get your burnishes on pieces like that or on a wet day. Well, personally, I really love the traditionally fired Acoma mm -hmm. pieces. I mean, it's almost kind of like that the fire gives its own final design influence to the piece. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of appreciate that as a connoisseur of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I fully support all artists that want to do the outdoor firing, especially mm -hmm. at Acoma, because for some reason, since, oh, I would say the 1970s or so, it has been falling off. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I, I want that tradition to stay alive as, much, as long as possible, just like I want the tradition of these handmade pots to stay alive. And that is, again, why we're doing all these demos, so that we can provide an outlet for all of the artists that may no longer have an outlet through Indian Market. And Indian Market, for those of you who don't know, is the largest juried Indian art show in the world. It happens on the Santa Fe Plaza every year in August, and it is a fun, fun spectacle to 
go see and to see all the people in their artwork. But not only is it a market of, you know, a place that artists sell their wares, it is also a very large social event because many of the artists don't get to see each other, even though they live in some cases next to each other, mm -hmm. they don't see each other for, you know, months and months and months. And it's a, it's a wonderful social gathering. And all I, I'll, I only have positive things to say about Indian Market and, you know, hopefully next year we'll be through this thing and, you know, we'll be back to somewhat of a normality. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of why we're doing this. Um, it took us some serious effort to get this, uh, this guy started. We actually came up with the idea in March when uh, the pandemic started and decided to order the equipment then. Well, that was the smartest move that we could have possibly done because uh, the equipment only showed up in late July wow. um, because apparently everybody is trying to do these sort of streaming events. And so we're, we were really lucky uh, and fortunate to be able to put these guys on for you and very, very happy that we can do it for you as well. So we're so glad that you're here and that you're healthy and uh, that you're showing us how to make these beautiful pots. And uh, it's really amazing to watch that pot that you're working on just kind of come out of nothing. And there is obviously no high-tech tools here uh, that you're using. Um, so, you know, what tools do you like to use the most? I mean, what fits best in your hand? I actually only have probably three tools that I use consistently, and it's the, the tools, the two here for shaping, mm -hmm. and then I have my stamping tool, mm -hmm. and then when, once I get upper to the plus, then I have my little paddle, so it's actually, yeah, the three tools and that I have. What do you use your paddle for? To shape. Okay. So, uh, like, with the smooth pots, you start shaping and molding your uh, pot to form. Mm -hmm. So like something like here where it's pretty much round, say for instance I want it to go more of a, at an angle, then that's where I use the paddle and I paddle and start shaping. Mm -hmm. And so you can see right there that you're working away and uh, the, the, it's coming out really interesting and I, I know that many potters work, who work in the clay have trouble with their hands. Um, because the clay dries it out. Uh, yes. So we use a lot of uh, vegetable grease in our hands. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, well, what, what do you use? <laughs> I actually have to get um, the lotion that has at least uh, some moisture because even after I wash my hands and I apply lotion, I have to keep reapplying because it does dry out your hands and you start having crackling and stuff, or um, <coughs> uh, Vaseline. I use Vaseline to moisturize my hair to, to not get it so dry. But yeah, the clay does tend to dry out your hands. Well, you know, if you go to a health spa, you pay a lot of money to have your entire body slathered with that stuff. And of course, when it dries, you look like you're 1,000 years old. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then it's all washed away, and it's all a, a wonderful feeling. But uh -huh. you know, if you're doing this day in and day out, um, you wind up all cracked and yeah. dried. And and we have one uh, potter who, you know, was really reluctant to come and demonstrate for us because he said that he didn't want people to see how badly his hands looked. And I have to admit that, you know, they were, they're dry as a bone, but uh -huh. uh, maybe he doesn't care for them. We had the first potter, Ruby Panana, from um, Sia Pueblo, and she said that um, working with the clay has eliminated and worn off her fingerprints. Oh, really? Uh-huh. I mean, do you still have fingerprints? I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> you better yeah, work I'm looking at my hands now. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but her fingerprints are, are gone. I was teasing her about uh, maybe this is a good time to rob a bank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no, no fingerprint evidence. No proof. Yeah. Do we have mm -hmm. a question? We, we have two questions, and they're both from Joan. Uh, Joan would like to know, is Acoma clay the finest of the Pueblo potters? Um, 
I'm not, I. It's for me. I think it's it's good clay, but every every uh, pueblo has um, good clay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just you no. Know, it it depends on how how you work your clay. Some pueblos have to strain it and strain it till they get the 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 right consistency. Ours, we use what we take out, and so we dry it. Um, we don't necessarily have to strain our clay. You just have to crush it up uh, and make sure it's uh, real fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I had um, some of my uh, cousins, what, actually I tell them, if, can you pound up my clay for me? And so they would take it and crush it up for me to where it's uh, almost uh, real soft. So when I'm, when I'm working with it and need, making my clay, then um, it comes out very smooth. So I think our clay is pretty, um, pretty smooth, and, and uh, we don't have to go through the whole process to, to uh, make it. So, if I could comment on that, I think that uh, from what my experience has been, is that northern New Mexico had consistently has really, really good clay, and uh, if you go much further south. Like we carry the pottery from the village of Mato Ortiz. Same culture, but it is 100 miles into old Mexico. Their clay is, exists sort of in a gravel pit. And uh, they have to get all that rocky stuff out of it. And it is uh, really, really difficult for them to uh, uh, clean the clean uh -huh. the clay, and uh, they strain their clay after they soak it, they, after they dry it, pound it up, um, soak it, they pour it through bed sheets. And you can imagine how fine it is through bed right. sheets. And they wind up with so much leftovers. I mean, you could almost put gravel in your driveway by what um, is left behind. Uh, so, and, and it's only after you do that process and what goes through that bed sheet uh -huh. that makes for a really fine clay. But if you mean fine in the sense that uh, it produces thin pots, that really has to do with the tradition more than anything. Yeah. And uh, what the function might have been. For at Acoma, for example, um, the women collected water to be used. They lived on top of the mesa. The mesa is about 300 feet high, mm -hmm. and there's no water, no gas, no electricity, right. no bathrooms up there. And um, the way they, they got water is that when it rained, water would collect in pools in cracks in the, the mesa on which they lived. And the way that they got, th that was their water source. And so the women would c climb down the cliffs with places where that were carved into the rock where you could put your hands and your feet mm -hmm. uh, in order to, um, to climb both ways. And the only other appendage you sort of had to carry the pot was on your head. Right. So you'd put the pot on, the empty pot on your head, climb down the cliff, scoop up the water with a pot, put the water back on top of your head, and then climb back up to the top where you lived. Well, um, water is really heavy stuff. <laughs> and, and you can't change the weight of water. The only control you had would be to change the weight of the pot. And so the pots were made just as thin as they possibly could be. And if you notice, Jackie talked about the temper in the beginning, and the temper is ground up pottery shards. So effectively, you're strengthening your clay with something that's already been fired. So you could make a really, really thin wall. But right. you have a limitation when you do that, because those ground up pottery shards, that temper that allows the very little of the clay to be used and to fire into a, a container. Um, in order to put all that temper in, 
you lose the ability to do a really, really high polish like they do at Santa Clara or San Ildefonso yeah. because of that, that fine grit that's, that's in the clay. And so if you're thinking about fine and fineness equating with thinness, that had to do with functionality. Um, with Santa Clara clay, which I think is, would be the opposite, uh, in terms of uh, the process of making the pots. Well, first of all, the water source is the river. And the river, you know, you just walk down to the river, scoop up the, the pot and carry it home, which is not quite the same as putting it on your head and climbing <laughs> up those cliffs uh, with that heavy jug of water on your head. And uh, also, Santa Clara does uh, really deeply carve pieces. So the fact that water was nearby and you didn't have to, you, the, the weight of the pot wasn't really as important as it was in, in Acoma. And the fact that you carve deeply into the mm -hmm. pots, um, their pottery tends to be very, very heavy in comparison to uh, Acoma pots. And for carving, when the clay shrinks so much in the drying process, as much as like 20%. So if you have a 10 inch pot, you're gonna wind up with an eight inch pot uh, after the pot dries. And when it shrinks as it dries, the faster it dries, the more, the qu more quickly it shrinks. And if you're doing deep carving, the thinner part is going to dry faster than the thicker part mm -hmm. and shrink faster and crack more easily. So that relationship between thick and thin has to be just right or you wind up with a pot that will be all cracked up after, after you carve it. And so it has to be thicker in order to achieve that right. ratio. So. Thickness and thinness of Native American pottery is not a way to judge quality. What it is, is it's a reflection of its former utilitarian use, and it's a limitation of uh, how you decorate it, and it's a limitation of, of whatever the local clay is also. And I know that's a very, very long yeah. answer. <laughs> uh, I could have said just no, but uh, uh, I hope that answers your question, uh, depending on what your definition of fine is. Well, we also have another comment from Joan, and the comment is, is it's really too bad, effectively, that traditional firing methods have kind of moved away, because she really enjoys the fire clouds, as do I. Yeah, and me too, me too, because I think, you know, here you're making this beautiful piece of pottery, and then at the end, Mother Nature gives her stamp of approval. And sometimes those fire clouds are just so gorgeous. And, uh, I mean, they really, really add to the pieces of pottery. Now, there's something out at Hopi called piki that they make. And, they call it peaky bread, but that what it basically is is ground up blue corn. Mm -hmm. um, they grind it really, really fine. They mix it with water, so it's uh, thinner than pancake syrup. Yeah. And they pour it on the hot rocks, and it cooks. And it's about the thickness of a piece of paper. It kind of tastes like a piece of paper, <laughs> too. <laughs> Yes, I have uh -huh. And those really fine paper thin sheets of piki, they roll them up um, and layer after layer after uh -huh. layer. And they're sort of, you know, like in the shape of a cigar. And that's what you use to eat a stew, a watery, meaty, veg vegetable-y sort of uh, meal. And you eat that piki bread with, with the meal. And uh, they make piki bowls. And the piki bowls are for mixing that watery cornmeal that you cook on the rock. 
uh-huh. and they're all they're always undecorated. And when they're fired, sometimes the fire clouds are so beautiful on those plain bowls that you knew no Mother Nature really, really approved of what that potter was doing. And uh, that was the decoration, which, um, you know, like in Japan, it's called wabi-sabi. Uh-huh. And it is sort of the, uh, un, un, not unreliable, but unpredictable, un- unpredictable designs and um, interesting elements that you get from accidents. And um, those fire clouds on those Hopi Peaky Bowls are wonderful. And I really, really like those. And if people bring pots that are ground fired from Akama, I don't care if you know they have all the intricate designs in the world and there are those gray clouds that, that cover them. Um, I buy them anyway because I, first of all, I don't want the tradition to die, uh-huh. but also yeah. I find them very aesthetically pleasing, those old mother nature. Um, but anyway, you know, speaking of fires and firing, um, have we heard any more about people keep people up to date on the fire here in Santa Fe? I know in California they said they had over 400 fires, wow. raging wildfires, and uh, the town of Vacaville has been uh, um, evacuated because of fire, and the, I mean, California is just burning. Well, we have a, a fire going on here that is up in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. What's the late, latest report? The, the latest report was of as of 745 last night, and that is 550 acres, 0% containment, and uh, upgraded from type 3 to type 2, which means more severe, unfortunately. But again, the last update was still 745 last night. They believe it was caused by lightning, and that it is in a very remote, rugged area. Uh, they can't, there's no roads or trails or anything to get into the area and the firemen if they're going to do any you know cutting and stuff for you know preventing the fire from jumping certain areas they have to hike in many miles with all their equipment and it's very difficult to reach and we've had uh, they've tried to do some things with helicopters but we had a lightning storm when the the fire first started, which prevent, which grounded all the helicopters, and uh, now uh, it's pretty windy out there. So uh, and hot and dry. Uh, so who knows what what's going to happen next? But um, when you look out the window, it's a really different view. In instead of that crystal clear blue sky, uh, we have a real smoky situation here and. People who have respiratory (coughs) problems have been told to stay home, stay inside. Anyway, so how are we doing with your pot? We're doing, going good so far. So I've actually, on this one here, I've built it up, um, added two coils, two more coils to the pot. So if you can see it here, there's still the corrugated part, and I've added several more coils up. Can so, you show a little more of the corrugated pot? Sure. Yeah. See, there it is right there. You see the, and it's still pretty, you can see it's still pretty wet. So it's going to have to sit for a few more minutes before I can start doing the, um, the stamping on them. Now, what do you use to stamp them with? I have this wooden tool. Uh-huh. And it's basically almost like a stick. And it's the back part of it, it's rounded off, so it's almost like a, a diff, Deerhoof shape. And this is the part I use to stamp it, this is the rounded part. So like your fingernail. Right. Uh-huh. And see, that's that's how they used to do it back in the um, or the old do, days. Do you ever use your fingernail? I tried it, well, look at how long my nails are. So, <laughs> and actually I've tried using my pinky just yeah. to see, and, and it would work, but... Um, it wouldn't, you know, you try to press down on it, but it, 
it will probably wear out my nails so fast too. And you know, this, this here piece belonged to mom and it was actually this long. Well, so over the years that she's used it and I've used it, it's already come down maybe two inches. So I'm now to down to this and I can, I'm, I'm holding it basically on the inner part. So it's getting smaller and smaller. You so need I, an extension. <laughs> Well, just think if you yeah. would have used your finger. Yeah, you I, might, I, I mean, have the, your finger would have been, even. yeah, there would have just been a little stump there at the <laughs> end. Your finger would have worn completely down. So it does, you know, you don't think that uh, it'll wear down, but it has. And I'm, I was surprised to see how much it's gone. And then just from holding it, I have this little indentation from just holding as I'm stamping down. So it's huh. actually, I. I don't press on it, but it feels like I've been pressing a little hard on the, on yeah. the so you have this little indentation here. Huh. So that's what I used to stamp with. And you know, I've seen on uh, your grandma, Jesse Garcia's pots, that there are um, like, not necessarily like a little groove, but like little holes. Uh, do you know what she used to do that? I, I, I think she was using um, a popsicle stick. <laughs> yeah. Cherry or grape? <laughs> Grape's my favorite. <laughs> so I think that's what she was, or she had to have had a, uh, seems like a flatter piece of wood because it's shaped like a triangle. So yeah, it might have been, been a, a, yeah. a thin wood, but more, more of a triangle shape to it. And then, my, of course, my mom used the same one and, and, um, uh, uh, so it's just one side. I think she tried making the other side the same way, but it, it broke. Neither one of us broke it, too, oh. as we were kids. Started eating on it. Yeah, kids, right. Kids. <laughs> but um, have you ever thought about using, like, a different design other than just, you know, like that little dip? Um, I have I have tried, and I've, I've tried to make one with a... Um, like a star shape to it. Uh huh. And uh, it, it, it as could because as small as my coils were, I, it couldn't fit on there. Uh, um. So I have. I'm still working on trying to do different shapes of, of the, uh, stamping. But um, I tried one that was made out of um, plastic uh, that you you would buy at uh, any arts and crafts store with, but it stuck to the clay. So as I was stamping, oh. it was peeling my mud yeah. off. So I said, I guess wood is better. Wood know. is better, or something Teflon. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about being modern with an ancient tradition. And it, this one here, if you see how much it, it's gotten bigger, oh, started yeah. off with a, just a small piece, and uh -huh. this is where it's, so it's built. It's building up there. It's going to come out to be a nice, nice size. Now you started the piece in, in a bowl, mm -hmm. and do you have a name for that start? For the for the base, it's just starting out my base in a in a uh, in a in a bowl. And actually, you know, I would, and that's what I was going to bring. I have the larger bowls, but those are um, they're those are made out of the pottery, the old pieces, and I guess it might have been my grandma Jessie's uh, starters, the uh -huh. peak, what do they call the peaky balls, or um, the bases for them, and in those ones she had, if you look in the bottom, um, it had the indentation or the dent in it, uh -huh. so when they, like you were talking about hauling water, yeah. or if you notice that some of the potters, uh, they used to put a... a on the bottom of the bowl, they made it curved. Yeah, they still do. And so uh -huh. when it sat on your head, it was like, you know, it, it made it easier to settle, you know, on your head. Unless, of course, you had a flat head. <laughs> yeah. but, <laughs> right. I, I haven't seen too many people like that. <laughs> so that's what, um, those ones I, I use. And then, like, when I do some of my half corrugated pieces, I'll use some of those. Do you, do you call the bowl a certain name? Um... Because I know in Tewa it's Puki. The Puki bows. My, you know, I can't remember what my mom used to call them. Um, but she, she, most of the time we just call them base bows. Well, we were laughing yeah. because uh, Kevin Naranjo was here and Clarence Cruz was here. And 
They are from adjoining pueblos, uh -huh. from uh, Santa Clara and from um, Ok Wingate, which was formerly San Juan, and the two right. pueblos border each other. And they said it was called Apuki, but in Tewa, Apuki is what you sit down <laughs> on a chair, <laughs> which is uh, sort of rounded yeah. like that. Uh -huh. Uh, except for some men who's are, who are very flat, but uh, <laughs> that uh, it uh, that rounded part of your anatomy in <laughs> Tewa is a puki as well as the container that uh -huh. you start your pots in. <laughs> and of course, you know they were laughing hilariously about uh -huh. uh, uh, the fact that you know when they hear people who don't speak their language talk about pukis. Uh, <laughs> It has a completely different, different meaning for yeah. them. <laughs> totally different meaning. Yeah. So what are you doing there? Right now I am bu uh, building up my clay. So I'm actually stretching the clay again. So to get it more thinner. So I'm, I'm working on the thickness of the pot now. And also trying to, um, if there's any air pockets in there also. It helps those me those nasty air pockets. Yeah, so it actually helps while I'm while I'm bringing it up. I'm also feeling with my hand on the inside, so you can actually feel um, the thickness, and then you can also feel if there's any um, bubbles, air pockets popping up as you're stretching the clay. So uh, I have another question from Joan, and Joan would like. Joan says, "Wow, I like the look of the corrugated and the coil. Do you ever make a pot with that, that kind of contrast?" The combination of the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I do the the like this one here is going to be half corrugated, so you have to smooth this on the bottom and then the coil corrugated on top, so it'll be like a vase. So once I come up here to this point here, then I'll make the neck out of cor coil pot, corrugated pots. So that's how it'll come out. And that's what this shape is turning out to be. That's what it's, I'm gonna make out of this one is a half corrugated. Oh, well, that sounds just perfect then. Uh, we'll get to see it all. Do you, were you gonna begin your corrugation soon? The corrugated coils? If, if, if it's... Um, if it dries enough, so as you're building it, you got to make sure that your, your pot is dry enough to add to the top. Because once you start building collapse. on the top, yes, yeah. that it doesn't come. So you're going to be angling it upward, and you want to make sure that the pot is um, sturdy enough to hold the, the coils on top. So I should have brought my hair dryer? <laughs> A fan, yeah. A fan. A fan. Yeah, there we go. You know, that's the other thing about about working with clay and Mother Nature is that um, you have to work with nature. So like now it's it's uh, nice and if you have to and bruise, dry. yeah. So you know the pots will tend to um, go they go actually the clay will go at its pace. Uh -huh. um, so you're not in control, are you? No. Uh -uh. you have to work with Mother Nature. So like it's over if it's overcast and it's gonna rain it takes the pot a lot longer for it to dry because the clay won't dry. Uh -huh. So you're, you're, you just kind of base it on what your day is going to be look like, your weather. Uh, if it's sunny and blowing, of course, it's going to dry quicker and faster. So uh -huh. that's where I have control, how many pieces that I can work with at a time. And how many do you work with at a time? Uh, it, again, it depends like on the size. On smaller pieces such as this one here, I usually can do six at a time. So what I do is I start all the bases off and I just go in rotation. Uh -huh. So by the time I get to the sixth piece, the first one's already ready to be worked on. Is that a day's work? Pretty much a day work. Uh -huh. yeah, a day's work and, and I can be sitting there making anywhere from four to eight and I've actually been Especially on my large pieces, I see I'm, I'm working with them for almost 10 hours a day. Just depending on the size. Um, small pieces can take me a day. I get to the next size, the mediums, two, three days. And so I get... if you have all these six pieces started, 
And they're about a third of the way done, and you get a call from um, one of your grandchildren who says, Grandma, my ride from school <laughs> left me behind. Can you come and pick me up? Uh, do you, what do you do to ensure that those pots aren't going to dry out completely and you're going to be stuck with pots that are half finished? And that's actually happened to me several <laughs> times. <laughs> Grandma, I'm like, okay. So what I do is at that time, then of course, thanks to the old hefty bags, uh -huh. you know, I I take the bags and I, I put them inside and, and cover them and make sure mm -hmm. that um, no air gets into them because you don't want them to dry while you're gone because you don't know how long you're going to be gone. So, so covering them with the, the plastic bags helps helps a lot yeah. and keeps them keeps the moisture in there and yeah. keeps them to where if you were ready to work on them when you got back. So. Well, I think that New Mexico is a potter's paradise in terms of um, being able to quickly go through your pots and you know be able to finish the pots in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. we, our featured artist in this uh, group was um, Wyandotte, Richard Zane Smith, and the Wyandotte tribe is in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. Uh -huh. And I asked him, you know, when he was doing big pieces, how long it took for the piece to dry before he could start, you know, doing other things uh -huh. on it. And he said, up to two months. Wow. Because of all the humidity in the air. And, you know, we've seen it here over yeah. and over again when it's pouring raining outside, the mm -hmm. humidity is 42%. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really yeah, good. I can imagine. And, and that's, like I said, at home for, for, for them to be able to, to dry. And the next stage would be for um, the coil pots is to paint them. And so you make, you make sure that they're completely dry too. Mm -hmm. And it, it can take several days for us, just again, you can, depending on what um, nature has for you, you know. If, if you are um, in, are you, if you're at this point, are you waiting for those two pieces to yeah. dry? Yeah, I wanna add another coil to start, as you can see the shape of it. Uh -huh. It's starting to come to form, so it's going to be coming in. So from here, so you want to let the the rim dry enough to you can add your coils, and then uh, start bringing it in. Mm -hmm. Well, then while your pieces are drying, maybe um, after we chat a little bit, you can go over and talk about some of the pieces you have over there with me, sure. because I think there's a lot more to know about wedding vases if people aren't. Uh, if people um, have any questions about it. But, uh, you know, I think that they're an important part of the culture mm -hmm. and uh, we should be as, de as detailed as we possibly can about wedding vases. Yeah. And uh, uh, anyway, um, maybe when we come back then, if your pots aren't ready to go, we can talk a little bit about paints. Did you bring any of the... The material you the, use for paints? I, that's one thing I forgot was to bring my, my paints and stuff, uh, especially the painting part. <clears throat> but oh, but I, we know, can talk about the yeah, what we, we yeah, use we, and where exactly. we gather and uh -huh. find our paints. Yeah. Absolutely, we can do that. And by the way, for those people that are listening, you don't go to Lowe's and buy a gallon of uh, <laughs> Indian red. <laughs> Uh, to paint on your pots. Uh, these, these are not those kinds of paints. These are paints that are made out of minerals and clays and, and uh, that are all found in the local area. That's right. So it, yeah, all of, our, mm -hmm. uh, all of our paints are uh, from home. We gather them up the river um, or we have to go actually um, like our, our different colors that we use, we go mm -hmm. find them, yeah. Yeah, we, we, you can point out some of those paints on, on the pieces that we have of yours. And you know, just a, a friendly reminder for everyone out here, the reason that we're doing that is because um, the economic source of um, a lot of the Native American artists, Indian market was canceled this year and their income has just been decimated. And uh, we're hoping that uh, 
many of you out there will take this opportunity to give them a hand, and in return, uh, you will be able to have one of Jackie's, for example, beautiful, beautiful pieces. Now, we have about 30 other potters in these 20 videos that we're doing. Uh, traditionally, pottery making is a family affair. So we've had a husband and wife. Um, and in one case, they collaborated. In another case, they each did their own thing. Uh, we've had mother and daughter. We've had mother and son. And, uh, and a bunch of individuals who, of course, uh, learned all of their skills from um, their mama and her mama and her mama all the way up the line. I'm over at the display with Jackie. And Jackie, what can you tell me about some of these pieces? And I think uh, my mom wanted to know a little bit more about the wedding vases. Here, as you can see, it's, it's all done in corrugated, the coil method, where I start from the bottom and I work my way up. Then I go back and I stamp. So I go several coils to stamp. Then I add some more coils and then I go back and stamp it and just start forming it to the shape. So when I get to this point here, then this is the, the uh, centerpiece is added on do the stamping on it again, and then I start doing the uh, the nozzles. And yes, of course, you can see there's two, and per the reason why it's called the wedding vase is because in, in our tradition, and many of the Pueblo's traditions, <clears throat> uh, when a couple is to be married or, and wed, um, they used to um, give them wedding vases. And what they do is they put medicine in the, in the vase, and at the time, you'll have uh, whoever, if, if it's their sponsor or whoever uh, sponsors the couple, then they have the groom drink out of the spout here and then the, the bride out of the other spout. So they drink the medicine, and you see the band that's right here. This re represents the bonding of the two. So you see the, the spout comes up and it connects. So. What it is is bonding the marriage um, and making it complete. So that's why they have the wedding vase. Well, when you said medicine, I mean, do you mean like cough syrup or, or Tylenol? It's, or? It, it's, <laughs> it's actually herbs that, that we have from uh -huh. home within the home, which uh, is prepared, you know, and um, you, you either have a, a if somebody that was in the traditional part of the medicine and stuff, they'll, they'll make the... Uh, well, when you were married, did you have a, a wedding vase mm -hmm. that you drank from? Yes. What's the medicine it. taste like? Um, different herbs. Oh, um, so it's like a, a nice tea. Oh, similar to a tea. Uh -huh. And you can taste like... Um, I taste it like different kind of root. Uh -huh. um, it has just a different taste to it. Is it pleasant? It's pleasant, so you'll have a good marriage. Mm -hmm. If it tastes really bad, yeah. does it mean it's going to be over soon? <laughs> yeah, that means it's going to only last a couple years. No. A couple of years, <laughs> right, and then you're out of here. Now, uh, did, uh, where, where do these couples get this wedding vase from? Um, either from a family member that, uh -huh. that makes pottery, or they'll, they'll ask uh, someone who does wedding vases, you know, um, most of the time, I'm, uh, people have asked me. In fact, I've got many, many orders of wedding vases. Well, we've sold a lot of your wedding vases that people wanted to use in ceremonies, uh -huh. along with, you know, what white guys do to get married. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's one way for them to get into the, the yeah. family, yeah. But, you know, it's a... a, a well, in speaking of that, uh, I know in some of the the cultures, it is a, a gift to the bride and the groom mm -hmm. from a sister of the mother of the bride. Mm -hmm. So an auntie on the, on the bride's side is usually the person responsible for, for making a wedding base. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for the, the ceremony. But you know, it's a wonderful idea because you know, it's like two, two are as one, mm -hmm. connected, connected at the top and not, you know, not tight together, but independent mm -hmm. of each other. But still, that connection, connection yeah. co that connection yeah. on the on the top. Yeah. And, and the the wedding vase that we actually got uh, for our wedding was from uh, my husband's uh, grandmother, Aww. and I still have that piece with the first thing. Of course, so it was a it was a blessing from her because uh, it was not more than I think a year later that she had passed away. Yeah. And, what was, but it was what's a her piece name? That she had made. Um, I want to say Lupita. I think she, she might have been a, a poncho. That was my mother-in-law's maiden name was Poncho. So Lupito so, Poncho. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Nice, poncho. nice. Well, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, you hear about Native Americans and they always have names like Running Bear and mm -hmm. Little Dove and, and all those kinds of things. And your grandma's name was Lupita Pancho. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, when the Spaniards yeah, came, right. they renamed everything and, uh, and gave the Native Americans uh, Hispanic names. Hispanic surnames. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. And uh, qu consequently, all of those Indian names became secondary, mm -hmm. uh, but people still give Indian names. Do you have an Indian name? Yes, I do. I have an Indian name, and then I also have a clan name. Uh huh. So my Indian name was actually given to me by my great grandmother, who happened to be blind when she was born, and my Indian name is Shewat. We say that again. Shewat. Yeah. And um, she was born blind. Mm -hmm. And um, this lady, um, this woman, you you looked at her, and when we were growing up, we used to play tricks on her, you know, because she was blind. Oh, great. Oh, Kids, right? Kids are the same all over the world. And uh, she knew exactly who we were. And of course, we all had Indian names, and that's what they, how our grandparents used to refer us by our Indian name. If you were called out, they use your Indian name. Is there a translation to your Indian name? Uh, from what I understand and what my uh, grandmother told me, it meant uh, like a wild flower. It was a oh. wild flower that, oh. uh, and it's actually part of, uh, I think, uh, a medicine herb too. Uh -huh. So that's how I was given the name. So you're like a blue mm -hmm. bonnet. Uh -huh. And then I have my clan name, which, okay, so we have, we're, we belong to two clans. Okay, so my mother, you, the way, in our tradition, in our Pueblo works, <laughs> you take the mother's clan, and mm -hmm. then you become the child of your father. So my mother was born son clan. So son. Uh -huh. So we're son, your big son. Now your father's clan, so my father was Yellowcorn. Mm -hmm. So we're Yellowcorn children. So, we're so your son clan, yeah. and you're the, the children of, your son clan and the child of the corn clan. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, so when they call us out, they, you'd be, I'm big son, but I'm little Yellowcorn. So that's how they, they take, take you uh, clan-wise, and then uh, that's how you're referred to us. And nowadays we, we've actually gotten back um, to our job teaching our kids Korean again. So they're doing bilingual. So my granddaughter, my grandkids, they all know their Indian name. They know their, uh, their big clan and their little clan. So I have my little clan. That's grand. mama's the big yeah. clan and papa's mm -hmm. the little clan. Yeah. Now, what's the purpose of clans? That's how they um, recognize you as what family you come from. Because uh, we have the different clans. The, the highest clan is the antelope clan. You have all these different clans. So that's how they know your relation to families. Uh -huh. I mean, you can be a big son and you can have, you see other little sons. So you're the the way they see it is you're the mother of the little ones. Anybody that's some kind, you're 
you're the mother of unless they're a big sandwich for you, then you're related very closely. So, so that's if you meet someone from a Sun clan that's from Acoma Pueblo that might live in Los Angeles, um, that's someone that you wouldn't marry? Well you're supposedly not supposed to marry your your clan. This is funny because I did not know when I was married to my husband that he was also uh, uh, sun, sun corn, corn clan. So he was red corn and I'm yellow corn. So and they're different clans, red it, corn and yellow corn? They're all in the same clan because they're all corn clan. Uh -huh. So then we had our kids, we named them popcorn. <laughs> popcorn. <laughs> Because <laughs> you know, you mix the corn together, you become popcorn. Yeah, so, they're, they're and we tough. never knew that for the longest time until finally, our uh, you know, we were told my mom goes because she had asked asked him one dinner time. We were talking about growing up and planning and stuff, and and she wasn't sure what uh, his dad was and what kind of class. And then we started talking about that. We go, wow. And then my mom goes. Well, you weren't supposed to be married to me. He's, he's your cousin. I'm like, oh. Oops. Whoops. 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 But yeah, that's how they distinguish you about who, what family you come from and who you're related to and what your relations are. Well, it sure makes it a whole lot easier when you didn't have any paper and pencil to do family trees. Right. If you could just, you know, have a clan identification. Mm -hmm. Now, you have you, and you have a, a clan name? Um, well, like I said, big son. So I'm um, Ushad um, Hano. That's how they say son, Ushad Hano. And then they say uh, they'll ask you like if, if an elder asks you, "Kwa Ushad Ashia," and how uh, who's your family? Who you know? What family do you come from? So that's where you respond and say, "I'm Ushad Hano Yak Akukanish Yak Awashti." So you're calling out and saying what you're. So they, oh, then they right away they automatically know. Oh, so your dad, Finnish there is Jafrima, you know. So they refer to my dad as with his Indian name. So that's how you find but, out who everybody is. Would it be possible for us to, you know, sort of move away and you take your mask off and say all those words without the mask on, so that we can get a real sense of what the language sounds like. Come, just come right up, okay. close to the camera. And, and repeat what you would, you know, what a grandparent might say, like who you are. Okay, like I was saying, my um, a lot of our elders at home, uh, they can see you or come up to you, and they they kind of know who you are, but then they'll ask you, "Gua erra the Ashia," which means who are you and uh, what is your clan, uh, what family do you come from. So in response, then you're going to say, um, because I'm big son and yellow corn child, I will respond to them, I'm Urachano Yaga Kukaniswashti, which means I'm big son, little yellow corn child. That's how you would refer back to them. So that's how they, then that's how they recognize you. And then, uh, then they'll respond, oh, so your dad is, and this is how they'll ask you. So Kukaniswashti uh, is Dyashrama. So they say your dad is, by his name, name, they call him out. So that's how they know who you are. And that's, you say, oh, that's, that's my family. Now, you said that Akama speaks Kiris? Kiris, yeah. Kiris. Mm -hmm. Kirisi. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but the Pueblos closer to Santa Fe are either Tiwa, Tewa, or Toa. And Carison. And Carison. Like, well, uh, Santa Domingo. Santa right? Domingo's Carison, San Felipe, Santa Ana, and um, I believe Zia too are all Carison. So we, we, we all have different dialects, but we still understand. So if I was to go to San Domingo Pueblo and they're talking, I understand what they're saying, but it you know, you have to kind of slow, slow down because they talk slow. They sort of speak like Spanish slow. Spanish and Italian. Yeah, they're closely yeah. related, but they're yeah. different. Yeah. So if you if you 
a lot of their words, they have like a slang, or, and they probably say that about us. You have a different slang. You talk, you know, we understand, but you say it differently. And it's the same way for all these pueblos. Like y'all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like y'all. There is another one. So, you, you know, but I, un I, I understand some of the words that they're saying, you know, when they speak. Now, if you go to Santa, Santa Clara, who speaks Tewa, yeah, that's, can you understand them? No, or? that's totally different. I'm like, uh, translation. <laughs> so they, they have, yeah, their, their whole uh, language is different. So among the Pueblo people, there are at least four languages. Mm hmm what about the Hopi? Do you know what the Hopi speak? Um, because they're, they're, they're another Pueblo, yeah. meaning village, but they're far away. Yeah, they're, they talk different. In the same way with the Zunis. Zunis, um, they, some of the words you understand, but they have a different, same thing, a different dialect. So it, it's, so their language is also different. Yeah, so they're in a different category too, as far as their, their, uh, when they speak their native language, huh. yeah. So it just it takes it takes um, <laughs> a while. And as my kids were growing up, um, they went to school here in um, Santa Fe at the, the Indian school. So they were actually going home with different families, different northern families. So they started picking up the different language, and their their parents had talked to them and. So they were asking them same thing questions. How do you say your your client? What's your Indian name? You know. So you have you have your English name and then you have your traditional Indian name. So. Are there any bad words in your language? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You're shaking your head yes and no. <laughs> Yeah, those probably were the, the first words we learned when we were growing up. <laughs> well, isn't that true of every language? Learning that language first? Oh, that's really funny. But, you know, if you think about it, the, you, you, there are 19 Pueblos mm -hmm. in New Mexico and four language groups <clears throat> that at least one of them um, is very, very different from the other three. The mm -hmm. other three can sort of right. uh, recognize mm -hmm. certain things in their um, their languages that they have in common. But with you guys, it's completely different, and we don't know about the Hopi at this point. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. True. Well, great. Well, that was that was really a fun little lesson. And now that we're looking at the, we're still here looking at the pots. Let's look at some of the painting on. The, like on the, the top of this wedding vase up here. What have you done there? Okay, this one here, it has the combination. So it has the corrugated with the smooth handle, but then I also put a design on them, so it's painted. So you see, um, there's actually the, the black, the brown, and the orange. Now the orange represents the water, and then the dark spots represent land. So you see, any time you have the lines, on the on a pot, it re represents rain. So these are solid land, and then these could, you see something like this design here. It's a feather design, and we use feathers in our tradition. We pray for land. We ask for water. Um, so that's that's how all this symbolizes. This is something that we uh, our designs represent what our beliefs and what we pray for, what we ask for. So that's where you see all the, the, the designs and the different symbols. So it's painted onto the, um, onto the wedding vase. So you have the decorative piece. And then of course you're gonna see the, the other type of wedding vase where it's just has the solid or just the plain smooth. And these are all done in coils too, so you have the coils here. And it's just a little bit more contemporary style, but it's still the wedding vase, as you see. And these down here are your owls? Yes, these are my little wise babies, my little wise owls. So you can see the, um, the features, the formation of it, the ears, the nose, the eyes, and then you have the wings. 
So this is this is my it's a little more of a, a decorative piece. And these are one of my popular pieces is the owl. So you see. Well they're really quite beautiful. And so do you add the wings and all the pieces at the end for yeah. the for the eyes and yes. for the beak and so once you, you have the shape of your pot, you let it dry just enough to be able to set the the the, the next layers on, which is the, the nose and stuff. If you add it on while it's still wet, the pot will collapse. So you have to, again, work with, with Mother Nature and make sure that the pot is dry enough to be able to add your the other features to it. Well, I am going to take it back over to Andrea, who is right over here. And Miss Andrea, what do you have for us? <laughs> I want to know the bad words. <laughs> maybe, maybe when we're off camera, that um, that might be a possibility. But now, uh, anyway, we're here getting. We're here to see Jackie Shativa today, who is from Acoma Pueblo, and uh, she's been demonstrating. Uh, the making of her beautiful white corrugated ware, a tradition that's been going on in her family now for at least three generations, maybe more. And it was uh, revived uh, after corrugated ware, where in prehistoric times was uh, really um, the way that you would make cooking vessels in, that, in, in uh, the Acoma area. And what her grandma Jessie did is they went from the humble cooking pot to a really beautiful piece of art. And her mama, Stella Shativa, carried on that tradition. And of course now Jackie is the next keeper of um, corrugated ware. And, and Jackie, are your pots a little drier now? Yeah, they're dry enough to I can work on them. So. With the corrugated, the coil pot here, I'm going to start adding the stamps to it. So I'm going to start stamping it, and you just kind of find off where you left off. Do you have to take it out of the, the pookie? No, but actually, you know what, I have a stand so I can be able to see it and... and um, so while we were over there, Jackie, we uh -huh. got uh, a comment, which was great to let her talk with a short time without the mask in order to hear her language. Thank you. You're welcome. And the, uh, the next question is from, from Joan. Joan was like, does she not smooth out the coil, then add the corrugated? No. No. So if you can see, I'm showing, this is the inside part. What I do is when I... At the coils, I go back with my um, tool here, and I slightly smooth it out just to give it the shape form. So I don't not I do don't smooth out the coils, and I don't go to the outside. If you notice that I didn't do any of this on the outside, so I basically leaving I'm leaving the coils, and so I've smoothed the inside out. So now I'm going back to where I left off and um, start doing my stamping. So. And then we have another question mm -hmm. as well, which is if we didn't answer this question fully, please uh, rephrase it or make it clear for us so that we make sure we answer everybody's questions. But the next question comes is, do any of your kids make pottery? I do have, I have three girls. And uh, they all have possibilities of making pottery. And the way... <laughs> so the answer is no? <laughs> they, yes and no. <laughs> they know how to start off a pot, but I, they, they, they don't have the patience to sit there and wait for the pot and then work on it again. So they, I've actually had to let... I tell them, if you want to learn, you need to make... Uh, I don't have anybody, my granddaughter actually is interested in the cor cor coil method, the corrugated. My girls can make, but they do know how to paint. They can uh, paint their pots. So what I usually, when they do make pottery, they'll start it off and mama's there to finish it. <laughs> so, I have, 
I have a question from Dan. I hope that answered that past, that last yeah. question. So hope, I'm encouraging them. I really would yeah. want one of my girls at least to learn and carry on the tradition. So they, they say when they have the time, they'll sit down and work. But my granddaughters are the ones that are more interested than my daughters. So I'm hoping one of them will take on and carry, carry my work on. Yeah, well, let's hope so too. And do, are your uh, daughters old enough to have uh, children? Yes, my oldest daughter just turned 40. And really? Yes, I have a 40 year old <laughs> daughter. The and you're next, what, 41? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm, I just had my birthday, in fact, just a couple weeks ago. Happy birthday. So um, I just turned 59. <gasps> Good for you. Good and for so you. now, uh, yeah, my oldest daughter is 40. My middle one is 34. And then my baby is just turned 30. Wow. So... And they're they're all actually they're all in the uh, the medical field. So my old, my oldest daughter has two. She's the old, she was the one that started out last. So she's got two kids, a boy and a girl. And then uh, their ages are I think five and three. And then my middle daughter has four kids, two and two, two boys, two girls. And her oldest is now. Uh, I believe she just turned 15, and uh, so she has a 15, a 13, 11, and a 7, no, 8, 8 year old. And then my youngest daughter has just the one girl. Okay. Well, you know, if we're talking with, in these conversations with the potters, it seems like the interest sort of begins, I mean, you see it growing up. You see it, as you get to play with the, the clay while you're a child, uh -huh. and uh, the interest to become serious about pottery making really starts in your teenage years, and in your later teenage years. And I've seen that over and over, and I think that uh, that's even true with you too, Jackie. Yeah, because when I started out, I, I mean, I, I thought I was going to... Uh, fall into education. I was a teacher and I taught for, geez, about maybe 10 years, 11 years. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was my, my path, was to be an educator. And then when I started uh, in my teens, when I was still um, barely getting out of high school and, and uh, working and then going to some college, and I, that's when I took my interest towards my mom working on pottery and seeing clay. So I started making, then I went back to work again uh, to try to help to uh, financial with your kids as they get older, they're more expensive. So, oh yeah. <laughs> and then um, my mom started introducing me to doing art shows and traveling and showing me the, the traits of uh, how to expose your work and how to you know, make sales and stuff like that. <clears throat> so that's where then um, I was more interested in staying home, taking care of my kids, and then then that's when I started falling more into doing pottery, making making it my uh, my choice then. So that's how. I'll, so I kind of went off the track, on the track, and then back to now. This is what I do. I've been doing this for, like I said, over forty. It'd be about 40, almost 45 years now, 43 years that I've wow. been doing pottery. Well, keep it up, woman. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, do you do you put any slip on your pots? I do. I have um, a white slip. It's sort of like a, it's a sandstone base type, but you got to strain it to get the, the, the fine uh, clay out of it. And I'm, I'm so lucky that um, as my mom was making pottery, she would she would um, collect all her her minerals, all her clays, all her stones, everything she's had. She collected, and she used to help out a lot of our our people from home too. And I, I did the same thing where they come and they'll say, "Would you like to buy some white slip?" 
Would you like to buy some shale? Would you like? So we helped them out. That was their means of getting money for them. So we would do that. So we've been collecting, and I, I would store, and my mom had stored so much of this stuff that uh, uh, when she had passed on, then my father had handed down to me all her, uh, her clay, her tools, the things that she did with pottery. So that's how I was winding up. And I couldn't believe how much she had stored away for as many years, you know, that she was making that I started collecting all that. So I have all this. And I, I, like even to this day, people will still come and ask me, what you want? do you want some orange uh, paint? Uh, do you want some white slip? I said, sure. So I, I do use the white slip to answer your question. I still do that. And how many coats of slip do you apply? Um, depending if your slip is, um, sometimes you can uh, make it too watery, so you'll have to use a couple coats. But I, I learned to be able to um, know the thickness of it, so I usually, on my smooth pots here, I apply it because I stone polish it. So once you apply the slip on, then um, I have a soft cloth, so I, I rub it down. And then that's when you have your stones that you stone polish it. So that gives it that smooth surface for you to be able to um, paint on. And so it, it depends on the thickness of the slip that yeah. determines uh, how many coats you apply. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, can you get away with one? Or? It, 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 yeah, I have uh, usually one or two, two coats um, because if you add, if it, if you add too much slip, then it starts to flake. So you'll mm. get that flakiness, then you know that you've added. And so you add um, the appropriate number of coats for the smooth pots, and then you polish them with a, a river stem. Yeah. For the corrugated pots, do you put slip on them? I, I do. Um, so they do have a, a, a white slip on them, and with that I have a, a like, sort of like a sponge, So because you need to get into your indentations and stuff, so you. But then, then you have, then you just go around and smooth it. Now, does it, does it change the crispness of the uh, corrugation that you do uh, when you add slip to it, no, or it, it doesn't because it just, the the slip is real thin. Yeah, yeah the now, slip, slip is, is thin enough that it just kind of it just kind of absorbs into the pot. Uh -huh. So then you have, again, you have your soft cloth, so you just kind of rub it. Oh, so you're so taking access um, if you have too much on there. So when you rub in there and smoothing it out, you're actually taking off if you add it too much, so you're rubbing it. So, you know, the, it, what so stays on, on will stay on and what does come on. On the corrugated pots, you do put a white slip on them and that you um, effectively polish with a rag. Uh -huh. rather than with a stone. Right, on oh. the corrugated, yeah. On I'm the corrugated. Using, yeah. Well, Dan, I hope that uh, that answers your questions. And uh, I also want to say, Dan, thanks for the email. And uh, I'm going to I'm gonna answer that question uh, on Sunday when I have a day off because the, the filming and everything is sort of all-consuming. But thank you so much, and thank you for telling us about the potter from Sandia Pueblo. We're hunting her down because um, the picture that you sent was really quite wonderful. And I'm sorry, this is just a little aside, because I think Dan is our biggest fan, and he seems to watch every day and participate. Um, and nice. so I hope the slip questions were answered, and you will hear from me soon. So we just have a comment, and the comment is from Joan, and she says, I want to thank you for bringing New Mexico. I really miss the, 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 the cobalt blue skies and the low humidity. I lived there for about 30 years, but I'm now in Missouri. Mm. Oh, I bet they don't have green chili like we have You're right. in, in uh, New Mexico. I bet New, uh, Missouri you know, doesn't know about that. But... Uh, um, and that's one of the things I'm going to do today when I leave is go get my chili. <laughs> go get your chili for the year. Wow. And I actually love roasting it by my, you know, on my own. Uh -huh. Sit out there on the grill and just, just the smell. Well, there's a guy 
Where do you go? Big? Is it in front of Big Five or um, what's what's the, it? the one that I like is in front of Smiths on Surios, and they open tomorrow for the year. Oh, oh, really? um, oh. The reason that I like them is they're the best roasters. In other words, the chili just comes, the skin comes off just like, one piece, and you just crack the head off and in the bin, and it takes you 20 to 30 minutes to peel a sack. Wow. I, uh, I go to this one place in Albuquerque, and we have them roasted, but I have to stand there and watch them, because some of them will just turn it so just a few times, and they, I said, no, keep going, keep roasting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. When I see what I like, then I'll say stop. So... Because I'm picky about how my chili is roasted. You know, half the time they don't cook them or uh, grill them all the way. So you're, you're, when you're peeling, you still have the the, um, the, the wet skin on it, I guess you would say. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you're able to peel that skin off, the, the meat of the chili comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, chili roasting in New Mexico is an art. Uh, Pablo Picasso and his paintings had nothing in art compared to chili roasting <laughs> here. And the smell, and, and uh, I'm sure you miss the smell of the chili roasting in the fall and the pinon in the fireplaces. I mean, this is really, really a special place. And of course, you eat chili breakfast, green chili, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I know people who even put green chili in their granola in the morning and uh, <laughs> that's about as far off field as as you can imagine but uh oh yeah yeah the, green chili on a fresh tortilla is the best is the best a little bit of garlic salt yeah <laughs> <laughs> we um you know during this time of when they have the market here there's a couple of uh, ladies that are from san domingo and i for I, ever that I've known doing the market, the same ladies and then their, their children will come out in the morning about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock for the lunch, and they have the, the thick, fresh tortillas. So you have your fresh tortilla, they have the chopped green chili, and then they add the corned beef. Ooh. Uh, so they make it into a sandwich. And every year I look forward to having one of those because it's the, the same family that makes it and their kids. Now it's their, probably their grandkids. Oh, that is yeah. so good. Well, you know, just like Derek was saying, Indian market is more than just a big sale. Uh, it's, um, it's a way of people renewing their friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, it, because, you know, that person that, you know, you're basically in the same booth year after year. Yeah. And that person that's next to you might be from Oklahoma. Yeah. And, they only, and you make friends with them because you've been in those same booths year after year for 20 years. And every time um, Indian Market rolls around, that's the only opportunity that you really that have you to see up. those people. And, Reacquaint and see what's going on with their families. And, exactly. And all you know, and all of that is gone, and you know, and all the smells of the the local food uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, the dances and the drumming, and uh, I mean, it's it's a and, and the color, because lots of people wear their traditional dress, mm -hmm. and and then there are fashion shows with very contemporary designer fashions that Native Americans uh, are producing. But there's also traditional fashion shows where you get to see some of the absolutely unbelievable yeah. uh, clothing pieces from the Plains Indians with beadwork, where the, the dresses that the women have must weigh at least 300 pounds <laughs> because there are, are so many beads on them and all their leggings and their headdresses and, and then the best part is when they have a kids fashion show where yeah. they show all the, um, and they're not fashions and they're not costumes. I mean, they're just their traditional garb on, you know, when it was a special time in, 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 in your tribe that, you know, that's how you would get dressed up. Like you'd get dressed up to go to church on Easter Sunday. So, yes. Uh, you, you know, you dress your kids up in all those traditional clothes. And so Indian market is sort of all those things 
rolled into one and uh, to not see them, see it anymore is really, I mean, it's tragic. But we're going to get rid of this virus. Yes. We're going to have an Indian market next year that is just going to, you know, be wild, hopefully, <laughs> so to speak. And the biggest Indian market ever. And uh, I think that uh, good things are going to come. You know, right. at the end of the First World War, what happened? Women cut off those black skirts and wore short skirts and fringes on them. They cut their hair. Uh, they got the right to vote. Uh, and um, great things happened after that last pandemic. So right, yeah. I'm really hopeful that we are going to have some great technology. And, you know, I was talking about this in one of the other uh, demonstrations that they had. And what I would love to see is that you know, in the garage, you had a whole stash of robots, and one would go to the grocery store for you, and one would cook meals, and one would clean the house, and <laughs> one would drive the kids, and and all these robots would do all these things, and and you know, you could hike in the woods, and and do all the and do all the things that you've always wanted to do, and let all the those robots, that new technology, take over all those you know, mundane, crappy jobs. <laughs> right. That women usually do. <laughs> anyway, but now that's just fooling around. So what are you doing now? Okay, I just got done adding this, the next coil. And so what I'm doing is now blending it into the bottom part of the pot. Well, that coil wasn't round. It started out round, and then I started flattening it. So you... you um, and it, it makes it easier for me to, to add on. So then you have about an inch of the, the white width, the width of the clay. So when you flatten it down, it's about maybe that wide. So I add it on. And then now what I'm doing is smoothing um, the clay downward to blend it into the bottom part of the pot. And it was just perfect enough to add on the, the the dryness of the clay was just right. So Joan does say that she misses the green chili in New Mexico does have the best food. <laughs> yes, we do. Hey, Joan, why are you moving back? Uh, we need more people like you here, absolutely. Maybe, maybe when you retire, Joan, you can retire in New Mexico because it's you know, really a great place to live, but don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing, all this, all the, we've missed all the feast days. Yeah, all the feast days. When, yeah. when is or was your feast day? We just have our, uh, the one in the, uh, one of the villages, Akamita Feast for August 10th, that just passed. And that and, was and not now, celebrated publicly. No, none of our none of our feast days because yeah. we had Macardi feast too in March, just before all this or right after all this stuff happened, they canceled that. Yeah. Or it was not March in May, so that was canceled. And all the pueblos, all the feast days were canceled. Yeah, canceled. A lot of them. Uh, I I saw on Facebook that a lot of the families uh, uh, celebrated within their homes. Yeah. You know having. You know, they, they still dressed up in their traditional yeah. wear and stuff and uh, beat the drum yeah. and sing songs and stuff, which was nice. And we mm -hmm. did, I think our, our tribe had a virtual, um, we're actually going to have a virtual feast day for September 2nd, which is the feast that is held up at Old Acoma yeah. on the Mesa there. So we're doing, um, from what I understand, our villainer is going to do a uh, virtual feast day. Yeah. So different families can participate. Virtual feast day. Yeah, that's going to be yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'm kind of looking forward to for, that. For those of you who are not familiar with feast day, feast day is not a party. Um, it's really a religious celebration. It's kind of, you know, I was trying to think about this, and, and I mentioned this in one of the other videos before, that feast day is kind of like Christmas, or it's like Passover where there is, uh, first of all, a religious activity, whether mm -hmm. it is a mass or um, it's 
the prayers of, of uh, Passover or if it's dancing yeah. on, on, the, on the Pueblos. Yeah. And like every sort of family and religious um, ceremony, there's food involved, uh, whether it's Christmas dinner or whether it's that, uh, that corned beef in the, um, the Passover dinner or um, it is uh, feeding uh, your families and strangers mm -hmm. uh, and on the Pueblos. Uh, that's really what feast day is all about. And the thing that's so unusual about the, um, the Native American uh, feast days is that uh, strangers are included. I mean, you might, I, the first time I ate at someone's house, I was completely bewildered because this very nice man came up to me and he said, would you like to come, would you and your family, because my parents were there and my um, husband was there and my uh, older son was little, would you like to come to our home to eat? Well, I, you know, it was like, sure. Uh, but uh, we didn't know what to do or, or how to behave because uh, here we were, strangers, uh, and invited to come in. And we just sort of watched everybody else. And so you just stood around and you waited until it was like your turn. And you went inside and you sat down at the, the table. It was all family style. There were lots of bowls of food that were around and they gave you a bowl to, to eat from and a fork and a spoon. And the food all got passed around to everyone that was seating, sitting at the table. They were all in various stages of completing their meal. And people talked to each other and, uh, and you know, you sort of, became friendly and talked about the things that you had in common and and all these delicious dishes and some some that I had never seen before. I mean, and of course there was green chili and there was red chili and there was pasoli, which is a dried corn that is cooked with um, the with meat and, and waters to make like a stew. And and then there were things that were I thought were pretty strange like uh, jello and cool whip. And, uh, and, and, but salad and uh, lots of potato salad and coleslaw and everybody filled their plates and filled their stomachs and gabbed away. And when you were finished eating, you didn't linger. You got up and you left and you thanked the, the people that invited you and you went on your way and somebody else took your place. And I was told, uh, later on that the, the uh, most insulting thing you could do was offer to pay someone for a meal because this is the Native American's way mm -hmm. of saying we're celebrating our religion and this is a very special time for us and we want to share it with you. Uh, but if you are invited to eat sometime ahead of time and you want to take something to people, I mean, first of all, a bottle of wine is not appropriate, but uh, you can, you know, like take a bag of peaches or, or something that you grew in the vegetable garden or something that you made. Uh, you know, it might be a pot holder or uh, it might be a drawing that one of your grandkids did. But, you know, something that's rather personal or something that is food stuff and uh, that would be an appropriate, would be an appropriate sort of hostess gift. And I hope everyone out there that's watching has the opportunity to do it because it's really, really an interesting experience. And then you go out the door, you go see more of the dances, and uh, then you go home and remember that, oh, that experience forever. And so that, do, you, do you feed people on feast day? Yes, we do. It's um, the girls and us, we, we usually do the cooking, you know, prior days we'll do all the baking and then you make your bread. So you, it's, it's a few days of work before the feast. But yes, we, we cook up a storm. We make all our chilies, tamales, uh, oven bread, salads. So, and like you say, you know, 
you can basically walk up to any house, knock on the door, and um, and they'll invite you they'll in. They'll invite you in. Yeah. Table set. They're all, you're feeding, you know, throughout the whole day, and you just keep. So for you know, you think sometimes you wonder, it says, "Gosh, did we make enough food?" You know. Or, but you know, the food <laughs> everybody never always runs worries out. about that. The, yeah. never, the food does not ever run out. You may think, oh gosh, we didn't make enough chili. Somehow it replenishes itself. Yeah. And, and my mom used to always tell me, dude, she goes, don't ever worry about not having enough food because it's always going to be there. I'm like, okay, and sure enough. <laughs> but yeah, we invite people, we dance. Part of us will be feeding, the other half will be dancing you know, during the feast days. So, but it's it's a good celebration. It's time when you get together with different families, go visiting, and, and you, you invite your friends, and uh, they enjoy themselves. And it's a big, fun, full event. And you know, we uh, most of the feasts consist of celebrating the uh, patriot saints. You know, the saints like we have uh, uh, Saint Lawrence Day, Saint Saint Esteban is the feast day on September. Saint 4th. Stephen. Yeah, uh -huh. so you have all these different saints that, um, like our church, we have Acomita Church, which is St. Anne's Church, and then we have uh, the, the church in McCarty's, which is uh, St. Maria's Church. So whatever church you have in your village or whatever the saint may be, that's your feast day, that's what you patronize. Well, I think know. that's really fascinating because... The Spaniards came in and they imposed Catholicism. Yeah, exactly. But Catholicism didn't replace the native no. culture. What it did is it just overlaid on top of it. Exactly. And so there, the Pueblos, most of the Pueblos were named for saints. Mm -hmm. And they have special Saints Day that coincide with mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. Right. And, I mean, one of the things that I observed is that uh, on Christmas Eve... Everybody goes to Mass in the mm -hmm. Catholic Church that's on the Pueblo, and then they go home, and then they get a, go to the Kiva in their traditional dance, and then they dress. Mm -hmm. and, and they dance for hours and hours and hours. And so here you are with two completely juxtaposed uh, celebrations uh -huh. on the same day for kind of the same reasons. And... Uh, and so I think that the, the Spaniards would have never been successful here in New Mexico uh, because uh, the, the Catholic, if they would have just said the Catholic Church is the only thing you can do, uh, the Pueblo Revolt would have been something far more bloody and, and uh -huh. uh, far, more, far more final than, than it was. Uh, and so... Um, like I said, they, they, they're overlaid on top of each other. Right. Yep, so that's, that's our, like you're talking about uh, Christmas. You know, we do, we in our, at Acoma, we do four day celebration. Four days at Christmas? Mm -hmm. Do you get presents every day? I pretty much do. When your family <laughs> comes and you see another family the next day, Wow. But it, it's, it's a, you know, we, again, we feed, so we, we have um, midnight mass, we have the, um, the, the birth of um, baby Jesus, so, you know, you, so we have that celebration, so you go to midnight mass at the old church, and, and you have the singers come in and sing, it's, it's, it's something you, you would want to go see, and then the next Four days, it's just dancing, feasting, eating, visiting, and just celebrating. And then in the evenings, they still have dances going on from house to house. They dance usually at the um, previous officials, the, the the officials that are going to be removed for the fall. You know, to, that's their end of the year, basically. <laughs> of um, it's the government changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have they they'll go dancing in these homes and stuff. So and people just travel. They travel with the groups of the dancers and just go from house to house. And it's really interesting. But yeah, and all that dancing really is not entertainment. It's it's a, a religious. Yes. It's, uh, it's any it's, more than if you went to 
a Catholic mass or a, a, a sermon by a Lutheran minister mm -hmm. or um, your kid was being bar mitzvah. You don't stand up and whistle and hoot and applaud <laughs> after it's over. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing is true of the, the Indian dances as well. It's very true. Now, ha do you dance? I've danced. I've actually, um, my last dance was for September 2nd, uh, two years ago. All my girls, my sister, and I, so there was, and then the boys. So there was 10 of us that danced uh, for from September 2nd. From your family? Second, from my nice. family. Nice. And what dance was it? It was for the for the um, for September second up at Old Acma for Saint Esteban. So we, we did the, and you have the, the north side and the south side. Mm -hmm. So you, we we belong to the our not north the east and the west. So I I came from the west side. Now are they sometimes called summer and winter people? In different pueblos, uh -huh. yeah, they call them that. And uh, so my my dad's kiva in was on the west side, so we came out from the west side. So you kind of go with where your family... Um, the little corn clan. Yeah. So we came from that side, and um, from each group, there had to have been over maybe 150 on each side. 150, mm -hmm. so 300 people were dancing mm -hmm. that day. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the, the two sides, the east side and the west side, take turns right. dancing. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, you take turns dancing, and then... And then, uh, well, what dance were you in? I was on. I was on the west side. So you, you was that like the corn dance or the? They, they the, sing several songs, corn dance songs. They sing, you know, um, follow the leader dance. Uh, uh, and then there's one <laughs> where you kind of go uh, the dance because it's the way you um, the way you form your lines. You're going intertwined. So you got to make sure, and and these little kids, I mean, little ones, they just know how to yeah. go, where to go, who to the, follow. The li the little ones always bringing up the rear, <laughs> yeah. and and the 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 guys that are sort of the the ones who tend the dancers while the dance is going on, how they're fixing the little you uh -huh. know little girls' headdresses, and they're fixing the little boy sash that's sort of hanging down yeah. to his knees. And, uh, I mean, it's really wonderful to watch. Have you ever been to Taos on Christmas to see the deer no. dance? No, I've oh. been wanting to do that. I hear it's very nice. Oh, uh, it was just absolutely unbelievable. First of all, there were about 100 dancers. Wow. And they had the entire deer skin, including the head, draped over them. So the head of the, the deer was sitting on the head of the human with the antlers and everything, and the skin was draped over, over their, their bodies yeah. as though they had become the deer. And when they came in, like in a double row, and there were a hundred deer, I mean, it was just so breathtaking, I couldn't believe it and the drums are beating, and the snow is falling, and, and there's Taos Pueblo, you know, four or five, six stories high in the background, uh -huh. and, uh, and it was just un absolutely unbelievable, and if you'd never ever believed in God, you would, certainly would at that point. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I heard about it, but I've, I've never been to, to any of them. I know I went, I've gone to uh, the San Juan um, Deer Den, is up there, um, and I know our neighbor Laguna. They have a, a same dance going on, deer dance. And at the end of their dance, the the little ones they take off. So the the people, the ma the women, go and try to catch the deer. And then what they do is they take the little deer and it's like uh, fostering them into their family, which is oh. which is kind of oh, interesting. Oh. So you catch a kid and kind of adopt him as a mm -hmm. as a, a guide child yeah. or a, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Well, that's really fun. So that's that's interesting too. Well, you know, at San Ildefonso, they do a deer dance in their feast day, which is in January. Oh, uh -huh. it's cold as can be, and uh, 
they start the deer dance just at first light in the morning. And the deer are in sort of the rolling hills above San Ildefonso Pueblo. Uh -huh. And just as the light is appearing, you look up towards those hills and you see the silhouettes of what look like real deer. Uh -huh. But what they are is men they, who have on their traditional kilts and their traditional leggings uh -huh. and their traditional shirts. But the headdress is uh, a rack of deer antlers. Uh -huh. And for um, in, in, in their hands there are sticks uh -huh. so that they can bend over and hunch over using those sticks as extension of their arms to make it look like the front legs uh -huh. of a deer. And the deer stop and, and you hear a drum starting uh -huh. to beat and when that drum starts to beat all those men deer abruptly look at the at the, where the, the noise is coming uh -huh. from. And it's almost as though those... As they're being hunted. And they're I, being hunted, yeah. exactly. And they're alive. They're alive mm -hmm. deer up there. And after they do that sort of... Um, those movements in the, the hills, slowly mm -hmm. they come down to the village and they do a very small dance and then go to the kiva and then later on in the, uh, the morning, the rest of the, the dances begin. And uh, really exciting. But I don't know if I could go back to Taos again and see the deer dance, only because it was such a moving and unusual experience that I think I'd almost like to remember that you know that the first time it's yeah. like the first yeah. date you know the first date you have right. to have with the the guy that's going to be your husband it's <laughs> sort of like you never want to oh. do that again because that first date was so special and so wonderful and the same thing is was true with that deer dance yeah do we we uh, like during christmas time we we have the different dances we have buffalo dancers we have deer dancers we have butterfly dancers just different different kind and same way with our deer dancers they have the air, they have the antlers and some of them are huge and how they can how they can even hold balance on the, them. yeah balance yeah. and then they have the evergreens you know as they're uh -huh. covering them and those are just you know they, they walk around the same thing with their sticks yeah. and then they look and they move and then it. they look yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's 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 really interesting but it's it's nice and um so we go up there, and, and this year I, um, we want, I wanted to go for uh, Christmas, but we don't know if it's going to happen or take place, but I'd like to go back up there. And that's the time that we all get together, and, and then the, the whole village does the luminarias, and it comes from the first mesa that overlooks Sky City into the valley. So the luminarias are lit from the top, and it runs all the way down the road up to the village and the whole church and people participate and put up their their so the whole village is almost lit up with the so lights. the paper bags yes the paper uh -huh. bags in in new mexico if you're not familiar with this tr christmas tradition instead of christmas lights that twinkle and flash off and on and are are um, um, synchronized with music, uh, that doesn't happen here. Instead, uh, you buy paper, brown paper sandwich bags and you fold the edge over the top like for about one inch so it stays open and you put some sand on the inside and you put a candle on the inside of that paper bag. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the sun goes down, all of those candles are lit, and there they are glowing inside of those brown paper bags and flickering because, you know, candles tend to do that. And people line the roofs of their houses and the walls and put them along the sidewalks, and, you know, they're usually about a foot apart, and the light is just really, really amazing. And 
uh, on Canyon Road in Santa Fe. They really go all out to for people to decorate their businesses. And you know, you can only really do it for one night because the candles burn out uh, at the end of the, the evening, pretty late. You know, you use those votive candles like they use in churches, uh, the small ones. And uh, the paper bags get wet with snow if it happens to be snowing, or you know, if something goes a little wrong, some of those paper bags catch on fire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. <laughs> that beautiful glow, and you know, if you ever um, want to see, get an idea of what that looks like, I'm sure you could Google photos of Christmas in Santa Fe, and the same thing happens in in all the pueblos, too, with those luminarias. It's really, really a beautiful sight. We have a lot of very, very old traditions here that you don't see any other place in the, in the country. Um, and it's really very special. So are you putting your indentations in? I'm doing my indentations now. The, the bottom of the coils are just right. So I'm doing my stamping now. And as you can see now, it's starting to form into a bowl. Have and you numbered your stamps in the billions yet? You know, I tried counting one time. <laughs> oh, forget it. I, after the 300 and some stamp, I'm like, okay, where was that? Yeah, or somebody, yeah, right. I get I distracted mean, and I'm like, 360, yeah. <laughs> or did I skip 350? Uh -huh. <laughs> and even uh, my granddaughter, one time she goes, Grandma, I'll count for you. I said, okay, it, it'll be a counting game. I said, okay, so she started counting. Well, I think after 20, she got bored, and she goes, I'm going to go watch cartoons. <laughs> yeah, go watch cartoons, yeah. I said, okay. Now, when, when you're making pots, do you um, have the TV on, or do you... Uh, Listen to the radio? I, sometimes I'll put on the radio and I'll just listen to the music or sometimes I'll have the TV going and I just visualize as I'm working, I visualize it while they're talking, if it's, a, if it's a soap opera or if it's a movie and I just kind of just visualize it. But if, I, if it's music, then, you know, that just kind of keeps me in, in, the, in my mode and helps me to relax. Well, I'm almost afraid to turn the TV on. I'm going to wait until November 4th, oh, uh, the yes. day after the election, and then I'm going to, well, maybe another day, maybe the 5th, um, then turn the TV back on. I know, that's, that's kind of, with us, we're like, oh, again, you know, no. Yeah, can't do this again. So we've been watching the old series of uh, um, Little House on the Prairie, uh -huh. That never gets old. <laughs> or we'll watch uh, The Monsters or uh, The Addams Family. Or, and we watch all these old series. Yeah, I love The Addams Family. Gomer Tuesday. Pyle and Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday, she was my favorite, that evil little thing. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'll either turn on the radio or, or even just, just sit there and you know, I wish I had recorded um, some Indian music, you know, our traditional music, uh -huh. so I could listen to that. Listen to, I keep asking my daughter, you should get me some, some songs, put them on a disc for me so I can listen to them. Well, maybe okay. then. Okay, now, Mom. Do you have the, I know that if you're um, a non-tribal member, you can't take any photographs and you can't do mm -hmm. any recordings. I don't even think you can do any drawings. Yeah. Uh, if you are at the Pueblos. It would be just like, you know, recording a, a, a religious service in a church. You know, that's just yeah. not appropriate. Yeah. And, uh, and so you can't do that sort of thing. But can you, as a tribal member, like put your phone on and, and record mm -hmm. the music? Um, if, it, if it doesn't, um, you can do it like if you're at practices, like uh, for feast day songs. Uh huh. But if it's um, our religious, uh, during the time of our religious songs and stuff, no, we're not allowed to. You can't record, you can't even take pictures, you know. 
that's not allowed. So, and you you have to respect that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but like when we have when we are practicing for our uh, feast day songs because they're so long, so you need to know your footings and because they they change up. So we would sometimes record those songs and then when we're at home we'll turn them up and practice the songs and stuff. Well, without understanding the language as an outsider, it sounds really quite remarkable because you know you're not you don't understand where they are in the singing and the drum beat is mm -hmm. solid all the way and everybody's doing their step mm -hmm. solid one you know in a yeah. rhythmic way and then all of a sudden there's an extra beat in there <laughs> and everybody does that extra beat <laughs> and then they go on some more and uh, yeah. I often wonder and that uh, that's actually happened several times when we, we, we were at practice because um, we will go to practice like maybe about five o'clock in the evening, and we'll end till maybe eight or nine. And the drummers, you have, you know, you got several drummers, and then one of them goes off beat, and then we're like, wait, that wasn't supposed to happen. So we kind of all, yeah. and then everybody all falls off track. <laughs> so then we're all trying to get back in rhythm, and we finally get back on rhythm, or they'll stop drumming, and this is, and they'll be. The singers will be arguing them or arguing amongst themselves. No, it goes like this. No, it goes like no. Let the, we. This is the way it's supposed to. This is how. It so we're like, okay, we're ready. <laughs> uh, well, if it's winter time, you know, and you're yeah. getting ready for a dance at, at Christmas time, uh, and you start at five o'clock, it's already dark, right. uh, and it's even darker and colder uh, as the evening goes on. Where do you practice? In someone's huge house. Oh, in someone's <laughs> Somebody, house. Yeah, we practice in the house, and, and just depending, uh, you know, who's, who's uh, the singers are. Some of them have long house, so they clear out the dining room table. They take out, you know, the chairs and stuff, so we have that room to practice in. But, um, or we'll, we'll do it earlier in the day where it's still daylight and stuff. So. Well, it seems, you know, from my observation, that is that the, the dining room is the largest room in the house. Right. Because, and sometimes the dining room will have like a, a couch or two in it, and it functions as a living room mm -hmm. too. But that big table for right. feast days is the mm -hmm. most important part in your house. Yes, that is, that, and that's where everybody gathers, is yeah. in the dining room. Oh. You know, or in the kitchen area the kitchen. where you have the table in there. So, oh, in, and, in, what I really loved was seeing all the women working in the kitchen. And I think if corporations were run mm -hmm. like those women in the kitchen uh, at feast day, I think that they would do. Uh, they would, it would be so much better. Uh, first of all, there isn't a CEO. There's <laughs> kind of a person in charge, and that's usually the person who lives in that house right. because they know where all this stuff is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need an extra spoon or an extra bowl or, or where's another pot or where do you keep the dish soap, they know where everything is. Right. Yeah. And the way mm -hmm. the women move is they move according to what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no one saying, well, you wash the dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, when the dishes need to be washed, someone steps in to do that job. And those people that have more skills, for example, in um, chopping or mixing, they gravitate towards mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But they also can do all the other functions as well. Yes. And, and it's sort of like this ballet in the kitchen where the women move between the tasks easily and comfortably. You know, when you, th you think about corporations and how the person at the bottom is trying to step on the person up above them <laughs> to climb to the top. And, but the women move in the other direction. They move according to what the tasks are. Uh -huh. and, uh, I thought that was really, really interesting, and uh, and I've even thought about you know in doing some of that in my own business. That you know those people that have a certain skill just move into that situation, and uh, 
It's, 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 and it, it's and really it, cool. Yeah, it actually, did, it, and the flow is just so natural. It it's just, so natural. It, everything falls in place. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's the way. That's the way it is when we have our feast days, you know, every, we, we plan a, a menu and, uh, you know, we say, okay, mom, you make your chili stews because we make them, you know, so we get kind of like designated to do the, the, the food part. And um, like the girls, they know how to bake, so they do all the baked goods. And, and then we just, when we're, on, when we're there at the house for the feast days, it, we just kind of like, okay, let's start getting the table going. And everybody just starts moving around, getting yeah. stuff done, putting it out, and getting the feast day going and getting everybody ready that's going to come. And when, um, you're at, when you're doing feast day, uh, what has your experience been with, uh, like, the number of people that you feed? Oh, my gosh. Roughly. We, oh. Gosh, I remember we fed, at one, one feast, we fed over 100 and some people. Uh-huh. And that's, that was, we weren't counting, but just the, the flow of people. And like mm-hmm. we said, when we had the food, I said, gosh, I hope we have enough. You know? yeah. And it just seemed to multiply. Yeah. So... Uh oh, we talked about loaves and fishes, and, and, and bread and stews and, no. and the main dishes is what we were worried yeah. about. You know, we had roast, we had chicken, we had turkey, we had just about every kind of meat you can think of. And but it was always plenty. It was always enough food to go around, and then still have some leftover. Yeah. Oh, the leftovers are the best part. Mm hmm. Uh, how how do families afford doing this? Everybody comes together, and um, we just kind of pitch in. You pitch you know, in, yeah, pitch in. Uh huh. You know we have. And you share it with strangers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even we sent our friends off with a loaf of bread or take some baked goods, you know, cookies, pies, because. At the same time, you hate to take everything back home, so you just want to just give, give out. And then, of course, you have your throw, your throw days where you throw, you know, grocery items and stuff. Yeah, well, uh, that's another really interesting um, endeavor because I went, I was invited to a governor's feast, uh-huh. and Gloria Archuleta and I went as the guests of Rebecca uh-huh. and, and uh, Dwight. And uh, Dwight was so kind to explain exactly what was going on and uh-huh. with the various families and everything. But the way the Native Americans shared the wealth is on the governor's day, mm-hmm. the governor's feast. Any other time besides the governor's feast do you do the, the throws and the, uh-huh. the giveaways? We do that like on... Um uh, on our uh, other, like Saint James, uh, which are not uh, they're they're not the, like the regular feast day. This is where we have the rooster pulls and and they they well they actually call it like the chicken fights and it's on horseback or it's they do one where you walk and uh, run around in the village then you do the one on horseback. So whoever is Saint James. Um, yeah, well, Santiago, uh, the yeah. patron saint of horsemen. Saint, yeah, Saint John, uh-huh. all the the uh, the male saints. So we throw on those days. So whoever's a Paul, Peter Paul, you throw. So the family gets together and throws off the rooftops. So when they finish the the, the rooster pool down below, everybody comes to the top of the village, and then you go from up on a, the mesa. On the mesa, so you uh-huh. go from house to house to house, and whoever is Peter, Paul, John, whenever those days fall, then they throw from their house. The families will throw from their homes. So and, it's and like a, what they're talking about throwing. I mean, you're not throwing rocks at people. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. No. Um, well, I, you know, I was joking with Rebecca that I think that on those days where there are, are throw days and or giveaway uh-huh. days, that she goes and cleans out Walmart. <laughs> and the day that I was there for that uh, endeavor, um, they, well, you know, we didn't 
know about that. We were just invited to come. Uh -huh. and, and Rebecca had for each one of us a big, um, well, it's sort of like a, a plastic basket. That, okay. Um, like a laundry, laundry basket. Yeah. Like a laundry basket, exactly. And it was, in each one of us, she gave Gloria and I each uh -huh. one, and every one of her family members and every one of Dwight's family members each had one of those laundry baskets filled with stuff. Uh -huh. And there were socks and oranges and boxes of rice aroni and cereal and fly swatters and, and uh, I mean, just everything uh -huh. that you can imagine that someone might consume. And uh, when the dance was over, each one of the dancers had a pillowcase. Mm -hmm. And so you went around to each one of the dancers and you took something randomly right. out of your laundry basket and you put it into their mm -hmm. uh, pillowcase. And when you got to the end, what you had left, you threw out to the crowd. Right. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that was in my basket was a five pound sack of flour and I thought well first of all I'm gonna have a hard time throwing this thing <laughs> and second of all if I did throw it that you know someone at Acoma would wind up with a concussion <laughs> they would have to be helicoptered off the mesa because you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I injured them but no and there was one of the ladies that was a potter that I knew so I just went over and gave it to her uh -huh. but uh that, you know, and you throw all this stuff out mm -hmm. into the crowd. And I would imagine before there was a Walmart mm -hmm. uh, or there was a general store that what you would do would be to throw your fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. from what you have grown or right. the meat yeah. that you have dried. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's a really sort of generous way of evening out um, the... The, the, not the income, but you know what people have. Mm -hmm. So they they shared everything in a very right. yeah. interesting way. And there were no super rich people and not super poor people. There's mm -hmm. no one on the dole. Everybody had plenty mm -hmm. as as long as everybody had plenty. Right. Yeah. And if it was a really really tough time and you only had a little, well, everybody had a little. Mm -hmm. And. Exactly. Uh, uh, it was a real, real interesting, eye-opening experience, especially with my five-pound sack of flour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's that's like for Governor's Feast. That's what, you know, that's when the one you experience, and it does it. And like again, it's families get together. You you buy what you can. You know, you you're not expected to, you know, go overboard. What or you anything. well, what you can. And then so. then you have to either your extended family who donate. So you get donations and donations. And that's how it, you know, it multiplies and stuff. But that's, then when you're doing your throwing and you're giving back to the people saying thank you for, you know, helping us out through the year or thank you for your prayers. Um, so that's our way of giving back, you know, saying, well, thank you. We appreciate what you've done for us or helping us or even if it's just your prayers that you gave you know, to the family. We appreciate that. Yeah, more of those feasts that are religious mm -hmm. experiences yeah. and not uh, um, celebrations in what we might think of as a party. Yeah. 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 And, and, and a lot of uh, people, non-traditional non people, are, are, you know, are your friends that are non-native, you know, it it's it's surprises them to see, you know, that uh, Pueblo people or native people do this you know yeah. and because you know my my um, husband even has family in Oklahoma and so he his family do a little bit of the same tradition you know celebration like when they have their powwows or their their gatherings and stuff that they do the same thing they give away shawls they give away blankets you know I was surprised one time I went to uh, San Felipe and this goes back into my daughter, my youngest daughter, got adopted into San Felipe, uh, the Pueblo, the, the mom. When my daughter was in school in Santa Fe, the, the, she was a dorm mother, so she took care of the girls in the dorms and stuff. And she really got to liking my daughter and 
you know, always helped her out, and, you know, she needed help. My daughter would go to her, like, just like a mama, you know, would take care of their kids. So she became very close with my daughter. So one day she asked me if she could adopt uh, my daughter into her family. She had her own kids, you know, but she just, you know, cherished uh, my daughter. So we said, yeah, okay. And then um, we thought that was it. And she goes, no, we have a cell. We have to do it this way because so, we're going to adopt her into her family. She has a... Um, we do it like an initiation. So it is okay. And she wasn't, she wasn't married at the time. Um, I think her husband had passed on or something, so she had to have a, uh, a father. So she asked her brother to be the father role. So we went up there and says, uh, we're going to have our little thing going on. And, bring your daughter up and, you know, dress her, you know, traditional wise. So we went through that whole bit and didn't realize what it entailed. So um, it surprised us. <laughs> and the the relatives of, of uh, the mom and dad, they were bringing in food items, groceries and stuff. So it was like a whole truckload. A truckload? Wow. So even like during their feast days too, same thing there. We were surprised that they were throwing out roosters and and uh, little goats and wow <laughs> and <Animals>. wow animals. <laughs> <laughs> like, and here we are. We said, okay, well we're gonna go grab. They, we took our little Walmart bags. So we took our Walmart bags. And the family was laughing at us. And so we, um, and so we were, um, they were laughing at us. Says, You're taking a Walmart back? I says, Well, yeah, um, we probably won't catch that much. She hands us a big old trash bag like this. She goes, Oh, you'll catch. Oh, wow. We could not believe, and sure enough, we couldn't believe the food that they were throwing. I mean, we were catching, we, we filled up a bag and a half of these 30 gallon bags of trash bags. It's such a generous, mm -hmm. generous thing to do. It's really, really amazing. So, but it's each, like I said, each Pueblo has their different, mm -hmm. you know, ways of celebrating well, stuff. How about a little snap it back into reality? Uh, are there any. Um, sort of family feuds that go on in the um, in the pueblos. I uh, think there always is. I don't, you know, families. Um, you know, when when elders go pass on and, or leave, you know, fighting, you know, among the property and stuff like that. But it, you know, they have that settled, you know, because you're. Anything that it's always handed down to the next generation and stuff. But as far as that I know, I don't think so. No. It's pretty. It's pretty mellow. Everything. Yeah, everybody's pretty mellow. Pretty, oh. Everybody's pretty good. If anything, you know, you confront the person and you ask them, "Is there something wrong, or what? You know, am I doing wrong?" And, and it usually gets taken care of. You know. Hmm. The time it gets bad is when they have to bring the sheriffs in, you know, our tribal leader sheriffs. Yeah. Then that's when it's gone yeah. overboard. Oh, yeah. It's gone, yeah, when it's <laughs> the line. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, you know, that's true of all communities. But it seems like in the native communities that um, that, that doesn't occur as often. No, no, because you have, you have your, your, your tribal leaders your traditional leaders that, that take control of that, mm -hmm. if anything was to happen. You know. But other than that, I've never seen anything seriously happen or anything like that go about. Well, it seems like you're really building up that corrugated paw. Yeah, it's getting close to the top. This is where I decide um, what it, I want it to to be, so this is this is where I go from here. And say, okay, what can I make out of this shape here? So your ideas start coming yeah. up. And well, start. Uh, I mean, the shape is really nice right now. Yeah, this the, it, 
it can be a seat bow, it can be an owl, it can be a wedding vase, it can be a vase vase, you know, a tall vase, and I think I'm going to make it into a vase or a bow with a fluted top. And then this, this piece here, we're supposed to do the half corrugated on it, so it's coming to full, and I actually need probably one more coil to bring it up, and it's ready for the... Mm -hmm for the next level. Now, do you make those decisions or do the pots make the decisions it's for the you? It's the pots. The pots Yeah, the, the way they start forming. Yeah, that's uh -huh. when I, I look at it and I'm saying, okay, uh, which way do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can try to, try to um, control it, but most of the time the pot talks to you, the clay talks to you, and that's where you say, okay, because if you, if you say, well, I want to make it this, and it doesn't start shaping like the way you want it to, then you say, okay, well, what do you want to be? You know, <laughs> and I, sometimes I'll sit there and talk, and the girl said, who are you talking to, Mom? I said, um, my clay. They go, your clay? I said, well, it doesn't want to go my direction, so I'm going to have to go its direction. So it's telling me what, I, what it wants to be. And they're looking at me and go, it really does that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they think, I'm, they think I'm joking with them. She goes, Mom, I think you need a break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I don't see that it's that unusual for some, some Native person to be talking to their piece of pottery. It's when the pottery starts talking to people that are yeah. Native. <laughs> then, then you start to worry. So this is going to actually be a bowl. It's a really pretty shape now, isn't it? With that, you know, the way it sort of dips in a little bit. Uh -huh. And then barely flares out at the top. See how it starts to form into the bowl. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and finish off so I can let it um, sit and dry and then that's where I start doing the, the rim and closing it in or finishing it off into a, a bowl. Is there any pieces that are your favorite that you like from artists that make or all of them? Well, you know, they wouldn't be in here if I didn't like them. <laughs> so true? I have to say I like all of them. It's those other things that are floating out there that I don't like. <laughs> because, you know, we're really selective and, and uh, we always strive to have as much of the traditional way of doing things as um, the individual Pueblo uh, allows. Uh -huh. uh, for example, like at Akama, a lot of the potters kill fire. And yeah. uh, that I understand completely. And so that's acceptable. But if it was someone from Santa Clara that was kiln firing, that would not be acceptable because the only way you uh, get the black pots this, is, uh, yeah. or the red pots too, is ground firing them because that's where all the, the control is. And if someone from Santa Clara made something that wasn't fired that way, it would look completely different and yeah. it would not be part of the, um, the tradition of their particular area. True. I like the traditional designs too, although every once in a while I've seen uh, kids do some really fun things. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, gosh, I coughed right into the microphone. Everybody out there, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but it's really, really smoky here. And some of the kid things are wonderful. When one of Nancy Youngblood's son, Sergio, the youngest one, uh -huh. um, he started making pots. And the pot had 
drawn on it a television set. <laughs> which, which was really good and one of the pots had a soccer ball on it but that, that part is, is perfectly acceptable as, as far as and they, they, have their, they have their own imaginations yeah. of, and one of Barbara Gonzalez's kids <coughs> made for me um, a little uh, reduction fired black micaceous cell phone and it had an antenna on it that was a pipe cleaner, uh, which was just absolutely wonderful. Oh, cute. So that, that I really like. But all the rest, you know, when I start seeing acrylic paints and a lot of commercial clays, um, then that, that is uh, not appropriate. Yes, very true. Well, you know, in the gallery, we uh, also show the pottery from the village of Mato Ortiz. And Mato Ortiz is 100 miles into old Mexico. Uh -huh. uh, they're Pueblo people. Uh, and what separates us is a uh, political line. Uh, that's what that border is, is a political line. And uh, when the the when there were Native Americans here before the United States, well, they, you know, they just sort of uh, had their traditional and tribal lands uh, in as many and, and as liquid as possible. Uh -huh. So yeah. we have a comment from Patricia, which is, this is so much fun to watch and your information is so good. And also, I wish I could be roll coils as beautifully as you. <laughs> practice, practice, Patricia. Yes. Practice for 40 years and I bet you'll be really good oh, at yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That's what it took me, pra a lot of practice time. Oh, but, I remember rolling, co trying to roll coils and I got little places that were so skinny that they broke and other things that were fat that sort of flapped <laughs> when I was trying to roll them out. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a lot of practice. One of the, the people I love to watch roll coils is Richard Zane Smith. And Richard is Wyan from the Wyandotte tribe, and the Wyandots live in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. Uh -huh. he, he was our featured potter in this... Um, series of uh, um, demonstrations and conversations. And his coils are the size of spaghetti. And, and I'm not joking. I mean, they're that skinny. Uh -huh. And to watch him do it was just absolutely amazing. He would take a, a ball of clay from, that he dug from his local area uh -huh. about a little smaller than a golf ball, sort of the size of a ping pong ball. And he'd roll it into a ball. And then with his right hand, he would start to roll it. And he's looking at you, and he's talking with his hand, with his left hand. Uh -huh. And the right hand is going back and forth, rolling this coil. And pretty soon, that coil is about four feet long. And it is the perfect, it's perfectly even all the way across, and it's as skinny as a piece of spaghetti, literally. Wow. And he, like you do, he leaves his coils exposed uh -huh. and um, smooths them on the inside, not on the outside. Right. And then what he does is he stains his coils. And, it, you know, if anybody's interested, you can always go to our website, click on artists, click on S for... Smith, it's Richard Zane Smith, uh -huh. and when the photographs of his work comes up, push on that little button that's you know that's plus, mm -hmm. and watch the the picture expand, and you will see that those coils are so skinny it's unbelievable. I always tease him. I tell him when he's here from Oklahoma, I'm going to buy some eggs and some flour and let's make <laughs> lunch. And it'll be the best spaghetti lunch in the universe because we'll have all that spaghetti all hand rolled. Yeah, some, some you know, and I always watch other artists too and, and see their work. And that always amazes me how they can do certain things. I mean, just like a, look at the Lewis girls. Their intricate designs and stuff, and I, 
Uh -oh. I don't know how you girls do that, but you know, I, I mean, I can paint. I mean, my designs are a lot larger in, in size and everything. It says I can do that, but I cannot see me sitting there. Yeah, you know, I'd be little. going cross-sided. You know, as much yeah. as I'd have to get thicker glasses just to see the. Well, you you remember Dorothy Trudio? Yes. From Alcama. Uh -huh. Uh, she did a lot of really interesting designs, including that swirl design, which she called um, the swirl mesa design. Uh -huh. uh, and it started off teeny, 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 like the size of the head of a pin, and then expanded. The design expanded over the pot as the pot expanded, and then the design contracted again as the pot contracted. And she told me once that she could paint for about two hours. And after that, she made herself so sick that she'd have to go in the bathroom and throw up because <laughs> the designs made her dizzy. Her own designs made her dizzy. And so the painting was you know, just relegated to a couple hours a day because she just couldn't do any more. Otherwise, it yeah. was the end of everything. Yeah, her, she had some beautiful work. Well, you know, we're going to have those Lewis girls. And we decided that we couldn't possibly have them all together at the, in the same room because... Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. because, I know what you're talking about. You know about. exactly what I'm talking about. The Giggle Sisters. Uh -huh. Oh, my goodness. The laughter is absolutely unbelievable. Well, last Tuesday, a week ago Tuesday, a week ago yesterday, I don't know what day it is anymore, <laughs> Uh, Rebecca was here, and Rebecca was here with Amanda, and Rebecca is the one who does those microscopic yes. designs. And tomorrow is Carolyn, and then uh, we have Judy and Diane together okay. uh, next week. And Judy, oh, Judy and Diane, they're next Thursday, and uh, then on next Saturday. We have Maryland, so um, all the Lewis girls are with us. But I'm, you know, they just laugh the whole time, and I can't imagine people would be interested in listening to five of the five of them and one of me <laughs> giggling for four hours. Uh, and so we decided to split, split them up. <laughs> split them up is right. I know every time I see them when they come back, they're always laughing. They're always having. Like their their giggle machine is always giggle on. Giggle machines is right, <laughs> and and you know when their mama would be with them. I mean, she be, she was part of the giggle machine conspiracy, that's for sure. <laughs> but really, really fun. Okay, and this one here. Did you see how much I've come up with it? Oh yeah, so. oh, it looks beautiful. I think one of the one of the things people can realize after seeing this process because you know you see other demonstrations and you know and it just you know here's one that is in this stage and here's one that is in this stage and and so on down the line mm -hmm. from you know the rocky looking clay until the, the right, finished yeah. product but you never see how long it takes to get from um, stage to stage and I think one of the things that this uh, offers is a uh, um, is a, a, a way to, to realize how much time all of this takes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And right now, I feel a little um, dense or, or where it's not smoothed out. So that's where I use my hand here. So I'm feeling where I need to come out and what I, oh. and then I'll get to a point where I'm going to, when it's dry enough, then that's where I use this, this here to start shaping it, paddling it and stuff. But it's still too wet to do that. Now, what that was a paddle that you have? Uh, that you, you know, that you have... That this you were, one here? Yeah. Yeah, what were you doing? What, you were beating the pot? Yeah, give it a little spanking, you know. You're giving it a spanking? Why are you spanking the pot? <laughs> okay, see how... I guess it's, it's okay. Okay. So see here, it's kind of like... Um, uh, uh, not even... So what I'm doing here is basically paddling it. Uh -huh. You're giving it a spanking. Why are you spanking the pot? <laughs> okay, see how I guess it's, it's okay. A wooden paddle is uh -huh. what it is. 
I have a tool like that in my kitchen that I use to scramble eggs. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. I, guess I have to try that, then. Yeah. <laughs> Whip up well, some scrambled eggs. Well, they'll be scrambled <laughs> hard if you leave any of that clay in that paddle. But yeah, this is what it takes to start shaping the pot. So you start forming your pot as it's drying. So you're you're making it smoother. So uh -huh. the, and see, it's still kind it of flimsy. It seems like yeah. it's very flexible on yeah. top. So. so it's still pretty fresh on top. So it's still moist, moist on top. But that's drier. But, but what I want want it to do, I want it to start drying, but I want it to start taking shape too. So you can just... I love that gray color. That is such a nice sort of bluey you know, um, um, gray. It's my, too bad. I mean, I'd love to have that corrugated pot in that same gray color. You know, there was um, a piece of, well, I actually, um, I don't know what I did, or I think one of the girls, they had to bumped into it, and it dried like that. So it was already dry, so I couldn't fix it. So I, the girls go, Mom, what are you going to do with that um, pot? I says, probably crush it back up. <gasps> I, they go, really? I said, yeah. So they got it, and they broke it open. They started eating it. Eating it. It, it actually is good. Tastes good, uh, Yeah. Huh? Oh. I can sit there and <laughs> eat some clay, and I'll have that little craving. So I'll crack off a piece and start eating it. Well, you'd never have to worry about whether you're going to stop for lunch or not. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's sitting there right in front of you. Yeah. Okay, so it's but of course, this is New Mexico. You have to pour some <laughs> green chili on that clay before you eat it. Huh. <laughs> so, okay, that's going to have to dry a little bit longer so I, so I can um, shape it again. And this one here, I could probably, what I'm going to do is add the top to it. It's just almost finished. It's on its last stage here. Well, I like what you do with uh, the white pieces and uh, that that clay at the end has a little eye on it. Oh, my and, little serpent. Yeah, and, and kind of a little s smile. <laughs> uh, I've never really seen a snake smile, <laughs> but I've really never gotten close, close enough, enough to, to, see one. Yeah, to make a difference. I mean, it's true that, you know, we live in the desert and there are rattlesnakes around, but I, I've never seen a rattlesnake in, uh, around here at all. And, but, you know, we, I don't think we've even seen any at home either. I mean, um, a bull snake, bull but those are harmless. And gar yeah. garden gar snakes, snakes yeah. and uh, gopher snakes. Yeah. Then and, you if, have and if I could um, somehow talk a gopher snake or two in coming into my orchard, I would just love that because uh, they would have uh, a really nice time because uh, the snakes would all be lying in the sun fat and happy because uh, uh, the, there are lots of gophers around where I am, where I live. Oh, really? Yeah. So, okay. And the gophers are really ugly. I've never seen a gopher. Go for close up. Okay, so I'm gonna add the the lip to the snake, and you can see it's kind of a little bit thick because mm. it's gonna raise. And will that be the the end of your pot? Mm -hmm. Well, that's absolutely perfect timing because we're getting to the point where it's time for us to uh, just about call it a day. Oh wow. Yeah, where's the time gone? No huh? kidding. Well, while you're finishing up that coil, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's coming up and, um, and what uh, everyone can do uh, if they wish to uh, view this or missed a part of it. Uh, if you go to youtube.com, we have a channel. It has the first 12 uh, demonstrations and conversations there and um, 
This one will be available to view probably in a couple hours after once they, um, YouTube uh, puts everything up the way it's supposed to be. But then, you know, if you miss part of it or would like to see any of the other ones, um, they're there, you know, probably forever uh, to, to take, a, take a look at. Uh, we'll continue on with these demonstrations uh, tomorrow with Carolyn Concho from ACOMA from 11 to 4, and then um, Sammy Naranjo on Saturday from 1 to 4, then the following Tuesday, uh, Candelario Suazo from 11 to 4, then Angie Yazi from 1 until 3 on um, Wednesday. Anyway, that's about as far ahead as uh, I want to tell you about. And if you want to look at the complete schedule, just go to our website at andreafisherpottery.com slash 2020, and all that information will be there. It, like you said, the reason that we're doing this is because Indian Market has been canceled. And as a result, many of our putters have no source of income, uh, no unemployment insurance, or and all those other kinds of government checks that, that might be possible because they're all self-employed. And um, this is a, a way to help them out and to obtain a beautiful, um, genuine piece that you've seen made right before your eyes. Uh, enjoy a genuine piece of, of their work. Now, Jackie Shativa is one of um, the potters we have on our website, and if you go to www.andreafisherpottery.com, click on Artists, click on S for uh, Shativa, and uh, then you'll see all the pieces that she has available. Uh, the pieces are there the first one is the most expensive one. They go in descending order down to the least expensive one. And you can either email us or you can call us on the phone. Um, operators are standing by. And today we have Becca and Jennifer. And tomorrow we'll have Amy and Erica and Denise. Uh, they'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about anything that's on our website, including Jackie's work. Uh, and also, you know, if you enjoyed some of this, tell your friends. Tell them to go onto YouTube and, and tell them to go to our, uh, um, our channel. And uh, please, you know, sign up with us on YouTube. That would, that would really help everyone a, a great deal. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, honey. <laughs> yes, it has. How long have we known each other? Oh, do you see, when, when mom, with mom still? Jeez. Yeah. I think since I was a baby, probably. Well, no, 30 years, probably yeah, 30, 30 years. years. We've yeah. known each other for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You were a teenager then, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I remember that. I remember you, your mom, you and your mom coming into the mm -hmm. Case Trading Post in, at the Wheelwright right. Museum mm -hmm. because that's uh, where I was at the yeah. museum before. Uh, how are we doing? We're, I think, ready to call it if you guys are done. Well, just about. Let me just say, Jackie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do and who you are and, and our thank you for our long friendship. And uh, thank you for making beautiful pieces. And thank you for bringing them ahead of time for us. That was really good. And thank you for being here today. It was a joy and it was a pleasure to uh, reacquaint and, and to uh, spend a lot of time. It's a privilege to spend a lot of time chatting with you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Derek. I enjoyed being here. It was fun. I always love uh, educating people. I know people that come to like different shows and stuff, they don't have uh, the time to sit down and talk about you know, your work. They do simple questions, but at least today you got to see uh, from start to begin, uh, from beginning to end on how 
uh, I do my corrugated pieces and, and same, even with the traditional piece. And I was um, fortunate enough that Andrea got, got a hold of me and, and I decided to, yes, do this. So thank you. I appreciate everything. Our and pleasure. I hope you all enjoy, um, enjoy this filming, the footage and everything. And when you're when that pot is finished mm -hmm. and it's fired, mm -hmm. will you bring it back to us sure. so that we can have it here in the gallery? Sure. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, great. Well, thanks again, and uh, and best of luck to you, and stay well and stay safe for you, your family, and for the for the whole tribe, so yes. to speak. Thank uh, you. And uh, we will see you really soon.